We get through Roswell and there's this little like antique shop. I walk in and I ask this girl, I ask her for records. My daddy got some records, (laughs) you know, like country, right? And she says, give me your hand. I give her my hand and she draws a map on my hand with a Sharpie. So I follow the map. And sure enough, man, I, I pull up and dad comes outside. He says, why don't you come inside real quick? And on the sofa is the biggest woman I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> the couch. She's, she's the size of the couch. She's using two shotguns to balance <laughs> and hold herself as soon as we walk into this house. How much? And just like throws a suitcase on the thing. And he's like staring like, pay up 50 bucks. And he goes, no, that's not going to work. I was like, we'll give you $100. And he was like, no, 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 that's not going to work either. And I'm like, 200 bucks, let's just get the fuck out of here. We get back to the hotel, Jim and I get back to the hotel with, with the two record cases. Then we're going through them and everything's just cooked. Just garbage, 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 garbage. And in the suitcases, it has a false bottom. Jackpot. You won't miss me. I'm a star. So I was ready to move on from that situation. And then... We break up, and then I am single for, like, the summer, and then I miss her a lot. And I remember hanging out with my dad one time, and I was just like, yeah, I feel like I was just, like, wanted to date girls, and I wanted to, like, feel free, and I was just, like, too tied up. But now I have a different perspective, and I kind of wish I would have acted differently. Mm -hmm. And then, like, six months after that, I was like, nah, I was tripping. This was the right decision. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Yes. But it's just, like, you're shifting back and forth. Yeah, the same things happened, but, like, how you feel about it, just, like... It's not even like it wasn't up to me to feel this way all of a sudden. It's just like time passes and like you shift your mm. your thinking about stuff. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. My end game was a little bit different, but I totally relate to that. I, I dated this girl from Kentucky in high school, Ashley Adams. Like she was a, a cheerleader. She was kind, a good family. And it was, you know, innocent, like sophomore, junior year. She like, sounds like an all American. Ashley she Adams. Is, hun- hun- Fried chicken. Hun- 100%. <laughs> apple pie, dude. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, like no crying in baseball. She was like, mm. she was perfect in that way. And I had no cause to break up with her aside from feeling this wanderlust. Like, I just wanted – I didn't want to be tied – I felt like I wanted to explore, right. I guess. Mm-hmm. And I didn't I didn't turn and start dating anybody else. Like, you know, it didn't turn didn't turn <laughs> right. into that. That's one of the options, too. Uh, and so maybe, looking back, I probably, would, though, right? I probably screwed up a good thing. Right. But I also would have probably had in my head that I wanted to experience the world. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. So 1992, biggest flirt, voted – <laughs> yeah yeah class certified I, full yeah f- recognized by everybody let's go i had love for everybody was Every- this high school your senior year everybody getting the love baby. yeah my senior year i was voted that way nice let's go dude yeah. did you get a wait we should probably say hello to everybody yeah we'll we'll, we'll, we'll break it in welcome in everyone a little quick little hello. little riffing before we get started started mj38 show episode number 68 we keep on moving we keep on climbing boom, boom, one boom. by we need, we need a little soundboard, some soundboard action. Yeah, if you have a soundboard at home, smash that bum 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 bum. Give me the horn. And smash Give the me like the horn. Subscribe and comment buttons too, please. There we go. As always, Justin, Matthew, MJ38, and today we have some special guests. Uh, one, one of my longtime friends, and also a new friend. We have Mr. John and George, George and John, J and G, or J and J if you're Spanish, the, the bilingual folk out there, Jorge, or if you like the Beatles. <laughs> exactly. There we go. Uh, we got Mr. John's a uh, sommelier. We we met in the re- restaurant industry or- originally at our previous employer. Uh, he's a he was a wine guy, gregarious, taking care of the guests to the fullest extent, depth of wine knowledge, sales, yeah. oh, sales and passion for the, for the industry, technical proficiency, charisma yeah. through the roof, leadership skills mm-hmm. off the charts. The kind of guy you want you want to follow into battle seriously. And then uh, we did follow him into battle because sometimes Many battles humble. When you work a job, sometimes it feels like war. Humbled. It really does. Love you guys. Um, Love you, brother. And then our new friend, Mr. George, owner of our, uh, I guess y'all, y'all go back, y'all go way back. We can, we can get into that, but he's also a uh, record store one. owner here in San Antonio. One more time, what's the name of it? Plug Friends it real of quick. Sound. Friends of Sound. Friends yep. of Sound. Friends Where y'all located at? 700 Fredericksburg. Okay, nice. And how long has how long that been How long has that been going down? Uh, we've been in San Antonio since 2016. Nice. Uh, established in Austin in 2006. Oh, okay, awesome. So nice, was, dude, were you in Austin? Austin was fire. I was in Austin. I wasn't there from the very beginning. I joined the Austin team in 2015. Early 2015 or so. Okay. Nice. Did a year of like a prerequisite work, I guess, if you would. Okay. And then opened up the store about a year later. Here in roughly. San Antonio? Yeah, here in San Antonio. Nice. Mm-hmm. 
That's yeah, awesome. That's awesome. How many of y'all came from the Austin spot to open up this one? Just me. Solo solo venture. Just, just me. Okay. Just me. Was it like a franchise option? So the uh, the store was founded uh, in 2006 by a guy named David Hafner. Uh, David Hafner is a, uh, if you don't know who David Hafner is, he's a, a world-class uh, record dealer, uh, DJ, um, big, big time, big time record dealer. Mm. Um, and uh, he uh, established a store in 2006. I was uh, living in Austin as a DJ. Uh, it's a professional DJ. Go and DJ. Uh, I had a, yeah, so I had a, I had a buddy who uh, I bought private records from. So I was able to like have buddies that dealt private records and like dealt out of their homes. But they had, these are the guys that had the sauce. Like these guys had the records that you read about in magazines mm. and like the records that like you just, that you don't see when you walk into the record store. Yeah. You know, so I didn't know um, that was a thing that there was records that were harder to obtain. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's more, there's definitely rare records. That's as, what I'm saying. In, in conversation, you had to explain to me too, that those maybe might be like more expensive or higher sure. valued records, sure. right? If they're For harder sure. to find and For stuff sure. like that. Absolutely. That's Collector cool. stuff. Yeah. yeah. That's like trading cool. cards, like anything like that. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, essentially like I, just like in any industry, like where, like you said, collecting cards or whatever it is you collect, there's hierarchies and collective tiers and S tiers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there <laughs> is like the coolest part of a hobby is that there's like S tier stuff that's like rare and difficult to find. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so after, um, so I finally was able to meet like the plug, you know, I was able to meet the guy and he'd call me and he'd be like, Hey man, I got this honey drippers 45, you know, mm -hmm. that impeach the president 45, you know, like he says, uh, you know, um, this is hanging on producers walls. You know, this is like the, the foundation and the, the Holy grail sample uh -huh. record for like all hip hop tracks. You know what I mean? This yeah. is like the sample, you know? And he's mm -hmm. like, I got a, I got a minty fresh icy copy, which is like <laughs> term, which is like slang for like <laughs> never played. <laughs> like, you this know, still just in like, like I got that Jordan's you know. in the box. Yeah, yes, exactly. Exactly. Crispy. exactly. You know what you, what you want to hear is a collector, you know? And he's like, I got it. I'm just like, Oh man. So it was this guy, his name was Jamin. Uh, and I met him through the circle of um, record DJs in Austin because I was a vinyl DJ. So vinyl DJs were, you know, there's there's a there's a difference between vinyl DJs and like digital DJs. You know, vinyl mm. DJs have a little bit more of a, uh, you know, a little, a little bit more of an attitude, I guess. You know, there's a little bit more of a purist. Yeah, I see type attitude, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, a romance with it. It's a protectorship. Right, You're trying right. to protect the purity, and so. Yeah. Um, for me, it was a big thing, but you know that, that kind of gets into ego and it gets into a whole lot of other things, um, which eventually I worked out. You know, but at the time it was mm. like it was just like, oh, you got these little cheap records, ah, ah, you know, mm -hmm. we're gonna mess with you. So there's a definite little hierarchy. So I was able to meet the guys in the record community, um, and I met this guy Jamin. Um, he wound up getting recruited to manage Friends of Sound in Austin. Uh, it turns out that David Hafner had a had a had a reputation of um, of recruiting um, knowledgeable, experienced mm -hmm. guys who just weren't say like customer service guys, but they were like straight record head knowledge. Like, they knew the industry, guys. like they yeah. knew music, they knew records, they passionate knew about it. They, yeah, they knew their stuff, and so um, so he hired Jamin, and Jamin and I were good buddies. So he says to me, uh, "Well, you're coming along with me." And that's kind of what he told Dave was like, hey, whoa, well, I got a guy. What package deal? <laughs> he's, yeah, he's coming with me. And I was just like, wow, okay, like this is crazy. Because at that point, I had already been going to Friends of Sound. And so I already kind of knew like the deal there. And like the thing mm -hmm. is out of all the record stores in Austin at the time, uh, Friends of Sound was a place where you went when you wanted rare records you know yeah, I was, like, I was, is that like kind of what they're like uh that that was kind of yeah exactly you rare know, stuff. um that and, and 45s uh which are the little the little small records not even the big the big lps okay um which start to get into the collect i mean they're all collectible but the 45s is certainly a a, a niche and what's the difference between thing. those two uh, it's one song on each side as opposed to six or seven songs on each side. Oh, okay. So it's also is that what came out first? Or smaller? So, yeah. So, I mean, so if you want to, so if, I'll, I'll give you a little, a little history lesson I want to miss that question. Want. Okay. Um, so the, the, the reason why the, so the 45, I'll try to make this quick. So if you go back to 19, I want to believe 1954, 1955 is when the 45 was created. Hmm. Uh, and before that it was, uh, put on a 10 inch record. Uh, and it was called uh, it was called a seventy eight because it rotated at seventy eight rotations per minute, mm -hmm. and it was made on a material called shellac, and shellac was very fragile um, and it would break really easily. 
Uh, but this was meant to be played on the big Victrola turntables with like, you know, you see those old antique like 20s and 30s and 40s. These were the records that went on those. So what ended up happening is, is in 1954, RCA, uh, I believe it was RCA. I hope I'm saying this correctly. Uh, basically created the 45 and they made the first vinyl record. And so the the 45 became the thing that replaced the old outdated version and which wound up becoming the format which radio DJs used. So when you were trying to get your – when radio stations were operating, you know, they played 45s. Hmm. Um, they didn't play big LPs. Um, so that's the reason why they – so they transitioned to the 45, which created the 45 single. That created like, oh, you want to get your song on the radio. Here's the hot single. They would give you a 45. Hmm, there's one song on it? Right. One song on, okay. on it. And then there's one, one on each side. Okay. And so usually on the other side, there'd be like one side would be maybe like a ballad. And then the other side might be like a rock track. And maybe the band's trying to show some diversity. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and this is their record that's going to the rec to the, to the radio stations mm -hmm. in hopes of being played on the radio right okay okay so okay so quick history that's so right. so the 45 is is a very kind of like niche kind of like type thing and so if you go into a lot of record stores you're not really going to see a whole lot of 45s huh. well, so when we, did the first record come out oh i mean that's the thing like i mean you know if you go back and we start talking about what i was just talking about like um the 10 inch record right the shellac right. record the 78s right you know those were like you know 20s really 30s wow. you know what i mean and some of the more expensive like years yeah and some of the more and when it comes to like and you start talking about value and rarity and stuff like that um the some of the most valuable rare records are uh, actually uh, 78s and the ones but there was but you gotta realize too there was uh big band records 20s 30s it was all kinds of, that was the format at which it came out but the thing that's worth money now is uh blues records hmm. so blues 78s because they um with a lot of blues musicians a lot of it wasn't recorded there's i i could get into i could just get into this whole mm. like we're beginning <laughs> to start off, we're starting go to go off. into all types of other little like subgenres and so uh, well please take know. us down the end of this tangent i'm, I'm so okay this. so i'll finish this one so so Is that like sessions the session so, musicians? right so 78 so so the 78 so the ones that are valuable are blues 78s uh m m musicians like uh jelly roll morton obviously like the big one that comes to a lot of people's uh um thought is Robert Johnson, okay. obviously, and we'll start and, and, and we'll kind of finish with Robert Johnson. And let's kind of wrap up this whole part of it. Um, is that the reason why they're worth a lot of money is because they didn't do a whole lot of recording, right? Mm -hmm. So, Robert Johnson, um, little San Antonio history. A lot of every, from what I understand, most of his recorded catalog was recorded in San Antonio at the Menger Hotel. So they had set up a recording studio and they did recordings there. Wow! So all the recordings that and you like hear a suite now, or something? yeah, they had a suite That's there. That's awesome. And uh, and so a lot of the, a lot of this stuff was recorded. And then in I want to say like the '60s or '70s, this guy named uh, Chris Chris Short. Oh gosh, I'm forgetting his name. But he started a record label called Arhuli. He started recording blues musicians because a lot of these musicians, blues musicians in, say, the 70s and, and early 80s were, were dying. They were getting really old because hmm. they had been playing. They were born in the 20s and the 30s, you know, and these are guys that crazy stories. You know what I mean? Like we're traveling blues musicians. <laughs> like, you know what That's I mean? That's wild. Like, Back in the you know, 20s like, and like, you 30s. Know, and you start hearing stories about like the Dust Bowl. You know, things like that. And you start hearing these crazy stories about barn parties and how people die. Juke and joints and juke speakeasies. Juke joints and speakeasies and stuff like that, you know. And then you start getting into like, you know, obviously like into, you know, like in the Dixie South, you know, Mississippi, places like that, you know. Um, you hear – it's in the music, you know what I mean? These musicians were like traveling, mm. you know, talking, telling these stories, you know. And the thing is that a lot of it wasn't recorded. So – it was a, a certain point where, so that's the reason why a lot of these blues 78s are worth a lot of money wow. because these are some of the only recordings. I yeah, mean, now yeah. things have changed. Like now people are reissuing things. They've remastered stuff, you know, they right. redo things, you know, but luckily like, you know, there was some people that started to get in a little bit smart as these musicians were getting older and said, you know, well, we need to record these guys like before they, that's something tangible. before they pass, you mm -hmm. know, and there's a lot of, and there's a lot of connections too. Like there's a Houston has a huge Huge, huge, huge lightning. I think it's lightning slim. I believe it's from Houston. So uh, there's a lot of like little Joe Washington, another guy from from mm -hmm. Houston, blues musician. Um, so there's a whole 
connection and then you start getting into like louisiana houston and then san antonio and texas and then like you know um you start talking about like chitlin circuits and on you know all that whole thing and uh, so it's all it it's yeah it's it's a whole bunch so anyway so back to the record store so i started getting access to these rare records uh got a job at friends of sound um was working there for about a few months and uh david hafner the owner um comes up to me one day and he says um what's your dream you know, and at the time I didn't, at the time I didn't know that Dave was like mega plugged, <laughs> right? Like Dave knew everybody. You only, you only met him a couple of times as like a Yeah, a exactly. Yeah. He was my boss. Like I was working at his store, you know yeah. what I mean? And, and I mean, at this point he was just like this figure that like I knew on the store, but like I hadn't really interacted with him yet. And mm -hmm. I hadn't really, so this was my, this was really him saying, okay, I got this new guy that's working for me. You know, I got to, I got, I got, I got to know him like a little bit. I got to get, get, I got, you know, I, I want to know this kid. You know what I mean? I want to uh -huh. know what this guy's about, you know? And so we meet and he says, you know, he says, I know you're a DJ, <laughs> you know, so I know you get a little discount on the records. I was like, yeah, that's great. You know? Mm -hmm. And he says, but you know, what's your, what's your dream? What do you want? And of course, you know, I, I, I didn't think anything, you know, really mm -hmm. of it. I was just like, oh, I want a record store. Yeah. You know, is what I said. And he goes, hmm. Okay. And I'll never forget. And he goes, okay. And he just kind of walks off. <laughs> okay. So a few days later, uh, I'm at work and uh, and he comes in. He says, hey, man, let's, let's talk in the office real quick. And I'm just like, oh, okay. Hands me a piece of paper. It was like a movie. It was like, it was like a freaking movie. He hands me a piece of paper. As soon as I grab it and he goes, there's your dream. What the hell? And I'm kind of looking at him and I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, he, and he's all... Just super cool, like Matter no big deal. He's just like, yeah, give me that much money and bam, you got your store. Let's make it happen. And I'm just like, uh, uh, can I, you know, uh, can I think about it? Uh, yeah, <laughs> can I think about this for a second? And he's like, yeah, sure, just let me know. So I, uh, I had some money tucked away. Uh, luckily, you know, I reached out to talk, call my mom, right? Mm -hmm. Call mom, call mom first. So I called mom, and you know, she didn't. She didn't understand, you know, but also too, like this is 2016, right? That I'm saying, I want to open up the record store. 2016 records were popular, but they weren't, they weren't popular like they're popular now. Yeah, you know what I mean? Market like, shares increased, you think, over the last, it's, it was yeah, more underground. Oh, yeah, years. it was, you know, I mean, and even, and even going back to 2006 when the store opened, yeah. nobody was, nobody was buying records in 2006. You know, I mean, I was. Yeah, let's say. You know, I was. I mean, I was. Yeah, I mean, I was. I mean, I started buying records in like ninety nine, two thousand. You know, like right after like graduating high school. To like listen to or to yeah to mix. listen to to listen okay. to you know yeah. um and if you want we'll get into that story too so mm -hmm. so Dave says yeah this will be your your record shop give me this money and it's it's yours and I was like okay so I thought about it talked to my mom my mom didn't really understand it you know she knew that I loved music and she knew that I liked these things but it was something that I kind of like kept like I didn't. I would try to keep it away from her because she saw it almost as like a waste. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. she was just like, you know, because my mom's old school. My mom's baby boomer. You know what yeah. I mean? She doesn't, you know, those types of generate, that generation of people didn't, I don't think, understand um, artistic creativity and like you can make a living off these things. Right. Like, you know, my mom was, you know, get a job mm -hmm. with the government, you know, yeah, get your, sure, get your yeah. benefits, get yeah. your insurance, you know, and, and you're good. Which, you know, then there's nothing wrong with that because, like, her house is paid off. Her, She's got her insurance. You know, we're talking about good. her her, her, her oh, death plans. Oh, okay, and she, yeah, and everything's taken care of. Yeah, she's she's nice. good. Chilling. You know, so so that's great, you know, but, you know, it was really hard for her to understand. And, and at the time, too, like, I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah. Um, up to that point, I had been working in restaurants and I had been been doing the server grind, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, that really didn't, I didn't really see an end to because like I didn't want to be a manager, which would obviously be the next thing, right? Like, okay, you've been a server for 10 years, like yeah, time for you to get real and get That's some the, insurance, like go, level get of you, the game. go and get you a management job, which is nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can be very successful and I've seen people have great, careers fulfilling yeah. rewarding yeah um, and enjoy it and yeah truly. and enjoy it yeah and yeah. truly enjoy it um and be passionate about it and for a long time it was something that i was definitely passionate about and that i loved and cared about but as i got older i started to say i might be able to like do this other thing mm -hmm. and not have to work for somebody else and not have to to do it like that 
Um, and so, of course, when I'm telling my mom, I want to open a record shop. She's looking at me like, ah, I just been there. Mm. Like, you're crazy. Like, what are you <laughs> talking about? You know what I mean? Records. Like, that's local. You know what I mean? Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Um, most of my family, you know, was kind of like, eh. you know, I have a cousin um, who's real successful, um, millionaires, millionaire family. And I was like, hey, cuz, like, you think you can help me out? And he's like, ah, uh, record store, like, eh, you know, and I'll never forget it. He told me, he said, uh, he says, you're never going to become a millionaire off your passions. And for him, like, he's money, he's business, you know, he's like, Numbers. Things, things have to make mm. sense, uh, you know, yeah. and he's like, you know, get a, get a, get a demographics report. And I was just like, come on, bro. Are you gonna, yeah, okay, I'm going to go pay to get you a demographics report for you. Like, why don't you just tell me no? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Come just, on, just, just say no. So like, so me trying to convince people and convince everybody that, you know, that this was going to work, they were just kind of like, you're crazy. You know, this is dumb. Um, but luckily I had some money tucked away. And so I convinced my mom, I was like, yo, like I need like this much. She was like, all right, fine. Let's do it. Let's go. For so, it. so I, I came back to Dave. I'm like, all right, let's do it. And so this was in, oh gosh, let me see. 2016 case so the store opened up in August of 2016. I started in January, New Year's day. I met the guy that was going to be the future manager of the store mm. who Dave already knew um, and put him into place and kind of was already like, Dave was already kind of behind the scenes, kind of pulling the strings Trying and, kind of, and for, kind of yeah. setting yeah. things up as much as possible, all while giving me the opportunity to travel across the country, buy records. Like I said, the prerequisites, right? Like you can't open up a store, like you can't open a mechanic shop if you don't know how to work on cars, mm -hmm. right? Type stuff. So, uh, so that's what he did. So he sent me all over the country. I went to Louisiana. I went to where I got California. I went to Utah. To like different record stores or to yeah, like a convention? To, 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 well, see, you got to realize too, like Dave is like plugged up. He's the, he's the guy. <laughs> he's the guy, you know. So he would he would basically like just kind of set up deals and say, okay, like you're gonna go here because there's a collection here that I need you to look at. Try to work out a deal, but while you're there, go find some more records. Mm -hmm. And it's it was a, yeah. And so James and so Jamin and I went out on the road, just turning you loose. Yeah, yeah cool. you know, we got we got stuck in Carlsbad, New Mexico, for like. I think I was stuck in Carlsbad, New Mexico for like three weeks. Three weeks? Yeah. <laughs> it's like stuck there? Like what do you mean? So we bought – we went because we heard – we got wind of, a, of an antique store that had a ton of records. And this was just something that we heard. Mm -hmm. So we did a little research. We kind of made some phone calls, figured out where the records were. So we go over there and uh, it's, a, it's a guy named Don and he's got this antique – building that he bought from somebody the previous owner and they had records in the in the in the up upstairs so we go upstairs and there's like i don't know there was something like thirty thousand records or something like that holy shit Jeez. right so it's like thirty thousand records and they're all like in the attic you know what i mean so it's all dusty it's just you mm -hmm. know this is this, this, and this is where like people talk about like oh i'm digging in the Diggers. crates no y'all yeah. ain't y'all are digging in a record store that's not digging you know? <laughs> like <laughs> digging, in an attic. digging is digging is going in a house where it's like 80 degrees in the attic grandma died like, you're in the, the, in the you know attic I mean? or in the basement like you're fall you're taking a step you're falling through something <laughs> you know <laughs> that's like you discovery know, that's rats are running past your hand oh, you know no. what i mean like, that's where the holy grail that that's where that's where that bro yeah exactly you don't Get the oh, without the, the, the rats, the golden light. <laughs> That's where that magic happens. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Oh my god. What's one of your, what's one of your most Picker memorable style? polls? So okay, so like a Charizard. So, what's your Charizard? So so uh, so it's part. So that's part of the story, right? So, okay. Okay. Awesome. So I'm in Carlsbad, New Mexico. So we're in Carlsbad, New Mexico, and uh, we we go up and we get these records, and it ends up being like thirty thousand records or something like that, right? 30K. So while we're there, so while we're there, we meet. So Don. So we start asking. So there's in, in Carlsbad, New Mexico. There's a lot. Of, there was like a lot of antiques and a lot of old stores like that. So we just kind of just started walking around and was like, "Hey, where are the records at?" And somebody would say, "Oh, I got a friend." And out of the ten people that would say, "I got a friend," and of the ten numbers we'd get, you know, there'd be one that came through or something like mm -hmm. that. You know. Mm -hmm. So we meet this guy. Um, oh gosh, I can't remember his name at this point. I think his name was Dom. And uh, so we meet this guy, Dom, and he's like, yeah, I got records, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so we're, we're 
go into this guy's storage warehouse to get records. And as we're walking through the records, he got he got a pistol in his back pocket, you know. And I'm looking at Jamin, and I'm like, "Hey, dude, like, we're like, we don't, we don't, like, we don't know this guy. We don't know anybody. Like, <laughs> we're in the Carlsbad, New Mexico, never God. to be heard from again. Yeah, so you can bury us on the desert. We're done. Like, what's, it, what's it like over there? A uh, sketchy place. Um, it's you know, it's it's um, the people are the people are the people are sweet people. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 you know, genuine people, um, hardworking people. Um, but you know, the city, the city itself is, it, it struggles, you know, like there's, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of like testing and stuff done back in the day. So a lot of the areas are like, kind of like, uh, a lot of radioactive materials and wow. stuff like that. Shut I mean, a lot of people Bro. don't really talk about that. And I didn't really realize that until I got out there and started talking to some of the people. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, Roswell's like right, right there. Really? Okay. Yeah. So it's, you know, you kind of start putting it's putting it all crazy. together and it starts making sense right and hmm. so so some a, cause to be concerned though i mean this guy's got a gun yeah so I'm, I'm a little freaked out right and i'm just like okay uh no his name was delbert that's his name his name was delbert it just came back to me that's, delbert that's his name was delbert. Than dom. Yeah. That's way it was something with a d <laughs> dom is hard dom is kind of i knew it was but delbert with a d. his name was delbert, delbert. Um, that's older and so uh but delbert ended up being a great guy Nice. Delbert's ended up being a really nice guy. So we bought some records from him. And then uh, we end up – this is the cra- This is the craziest story. This is the craziest part of this whole New Mexico trip. Probably one of the craziest out of all the – well, okay. Build the suspense, so, baby. So we're, driving, so we're driving through Roswell. We get through Roswell, and there's this little, like, antique shop, like, out kind of maybe, like, about four or five miles, like, outside of Roswell. So it's there's nothing out there. Pulling this little antique store. And I go up and I ask, I walk in and I ask this girl, I ask her for records. And she's country as my, my, my daddy, my daddy got some records, <laughs> yeah. you know, like country, right? Unironically, that's her. And I'm like, okay. And she says, and she says, give me your hand. I give her my hand and she draws a map on my hand with a Sharpie and says, that's where my daddy's at. He has records there. What the hell? <laughs> That's, that would never happen in 2024. So That's an archive. True, true story. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not joking, man. This true is story. Awesome. This sounds like a fever dream. So, mm-hmm. so I look at Jamie. So I get right. back in the car. I look at Jamie and I go, Jamie, we're going to get these records. He says, let's go. I said, fuck it. Let's go. So I follow the map. Um, <laughs> and I get to a, a, a trailer, you know. And sure enough, man, I, I pull up and dad comes outside. And he's like, are you looking for the records? I was like, yeah. And he was okay. And so he uh, he says, but this was like, it was like he did a power move. It was like he did a little move just just so that I check you, just so that I knew what was going on. Okay, right? yeah, you're a stranger. At his he place. says, he says, he says, why don't you come inside real quick? Okay, I said, okay. So Jamin and I walk in. Oh, gosh. I just imagine crazy. Matthew McConaughey standing next to you while you tell so, this so, movie-like so, story. Yeah. So Jamin and I walk into Great this trailer. Great so, <laughs> so Jamin and I walk into this trailer, and on the sofa is the biggest woman I've ever seen in my life. Oh, biggest <laughs> the what? She's, I'll put it this way. She's like colossal. Like she's, like 6'7"? Like like, no, no, no. She is the couch. She's, she's the size of the couch. Angel hey, Reese. Whoa. She is the couch. Okay, yeah, got yeah. it. <laughs> and... She's using two shotguns <laughs> to balance and hold herself as soon as we walk into this house. Holy shit. Strapped. Bro. Double strapped. Two straps. shotguns. She's holding them and she's looking at me. Hold on. And tell me. Jamming. Is she sitting on the couch? She's sitting with on the like, couch. How like, fast with... could she be? <laughs> right. With the quick draw. <laughs> <laughs> with the akimbo? <laughs> <She's got> fucking... <laughs> Double, yeah. You'd be half a mile away. She's Jane Wick over here? Double. Jane double. Wick. No, she's holding okay. two. Okay, so she's in a squat with the with a good posture and she's holding, holding herself up like shotguns. this. Okay, I'm with you. Yeah, on the sofa. And I look at Jamin, and Jamin looks at me, and we walk right out the door. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I walk out. I'm like, oh man, I don't like, but I'm trying to not look like I'm scared Keep it cool. either, right? <laughs> I'm not trying to run out of the bed. Yeah, <laughs> not yet at least. You so like, I kind of walk in. I remember I walk in. I look at it. I go, okay. Sounds turn like around. Sounds like a Tarantino script. I turn around. I was gonna say, dude, you might. Oh, sorry, I was right there with you. A little guy comes out with the Dominatrix outfit on in a second. <laughs> the get, I, the get, <laughs> that's what I was. I sure turn around, next. I look, I turn around, I look at Jamin. He gives me one look. We kind of do the, we meet eyes, uh-huh. you know, we kind of do the, 
Oh, what do you think? And then I, and then I, so then I just step outside real casually. I just step outside. Like you're a smoky cigarette. Yeah, take a, yeah exactly. Yeah, like take a, take a, a smoke ball. break. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I go outside. Jamie comes out there with me. Dad comes out and he's got, uh, he's got two suitcases. And so he grabs the suitcases and he puts them on the counter and he's like, and, it, and, and, and you got to realize too, like I'm dealing with somebody who doesn't deal records, right? He just happens to have records in his Some suitcase. guy who yeah. Yeah. has a, his, a daughter and is so his daughter? Tr- tr- yeah. So, tr- so traditionally, you know, there's a, there's a, hey, I'll let me look the through these. Let me see what Let me you make got. you an offer. Right. Yeah. No, nah, this dude was not playing. Like it was Pokemon cards. He was like, he was like, how much? And just like throws a suitcase on the thing. And, I, and I'm like. This is big business. You make an I'm offer. Like, I'm like, can I open it? And he's what's, like, what's and he's in like there? Yeah. yeah. So I open the suitcase, and there's 45s in the suitcase, uh-huh. and he's like staring, like, pay up. You know what I mean? Like, he's like, pay up. I mean, like, here he they are. He has. Pay up. There was no like negotiating. There was no like, oh, I'm mm-hmm. gonna look through these real quick and make Do a decision. Don't. Yeah, it was just straight up. Oh shit! <laughs> like a fucking like and, a store and there, so, Yeah, <laughs> shotgun deal. <deals. laughs> <laughs> and so I turn around and I look at Jamin, right? And Jamin's got this. And, and the other thing too, right? Jamin's like six two. Jamin's a big guy. Okay. You know, Jamin's how old are these people? Dude. Oh gosh, probably in their. 60s, 60s. 60s. And what's yeah, daddy look like? <laughs> oh, he's he looks country just like daddy. you would imagine. Yeah, daddy country overalls. Mm. Overalls. You know, like, Unkempt hair, yeah, beard. No shoes. Country strong. Yeah, you know. Probably don't like, fuck with him. Yeah. Probably drunk. Didn't, didn't want to mess with none <laughs> of these people. And yet sober because he's used to it. <laughs> he's in his actually best thing he's going to be all day right then. <laughs> Probably. He's yeah. peaking. Yeah. <laughs> so, so dad shows up and he's just like, how much? And I'm looking at him and I'm like... I look at Jamin and Jamin goes, 50 bucks. And he goes, no, nah, that's not going to work. And I was like, I was like, we'll give you a hundred dollars. And he was like, no, 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 that's not going to work either. And I'm like, 200 bucks. Let's just get the fuck out of here. Yo, that was more like a get the fuck out. Not like a, a real evaluation. Give, <laughs> give, give him the T says, all right, fine. We give him the 200 bucks. We give him the crime. We get the fuck out of there as fast as possible. So you haven't been able to pour through. You just have cases. Two, you have a suitcase, suitcase full of cases. Two suitcases oh, two full of cases. And, and your life. Yeah. Two, <laughs> suitcase, two suitcases full of cases. Yeah. And, and based on like, I did a real quick like open and a, and, and a look. Mm-hmm. And they were just thrashed. You know, these were these were cooked. These records were cooked. You could uh, say you paid $200 to live. Yeah. So, <laughs> exactly. So we get back to the hotel. Jamin and I are just on the drive back, like, what was that the, real? What the what hell is that, dude? Like, that was nuts. Look at the fucking That's map a still movie, on your bro. Like, what the math? Like, just driving like this with Matthew McConaughey next to you. Like, just sitting That's crazy, there. dude. What? You know, like, we got out of there. You know what I mean? Ooh. So, so we get out. We laugh about it. You know, we're just like, damn, we get a beer. <laughs> <laughs> we stop in Roswell. We get a beer, which was weird too. Um, mm-hmm. What year is this? This is 20, 2016. Nice. Okay, cool. 20, no, oh gosh, maybe, maybe 2015. I'm trying to remember. Like, obviously, you know, after, you know, when time passes, you know, things get kind of blurry. But 2015, 2016 ish, I can't really remember exactly. Well, that story sounds like it's out of 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah, the 70s. No, this was kind of recent. This was kind of recent. <laughs> so we get back to the hotel. It's crazy. So we get back to the hotel and, uh, and we've been buying records. So the hotel's full. The whole trip, yeah. <laughs> the hotel's just full of records. There's records all over the floor. And at this point, we've been there for like a couple of weeks now. And we have the deal that we still did with the antique dealer guy and the deal that we still did with Delbert. So at this point, we have purchased – When I'm at the point of this story right now, we've purchased about 35, 40,000 records. Holy what? Shit, right. Oh my god! But what is that? How much space does that take? So up? <laughs> that's the reason why we got stuck. Ah, you had because to ship and all that. we had to get them back. Yeah. So we were so we were doing like the uh, the U ship bid right because we needed like an eighteen wheeler to load these things up. We had to put them on pallets and wrap them and mm, wow. the whole. Fuck. So in, the whole are they thing. crazy dusty in the hotel room? But still like raw as can be. Well, see. So well, there's well, there's the records that we bought from from Delbert and from and from Don. Don was the guy who owned the antique shop. There we go. That's Coming what back. it was. Got it all. Come That's on now. Was. Don was the guy that owned the antique shop. So those are the records that we bought from Don and Delbert, but they were at Don's place. 
the records that we had in the hotel room were records that we had just bought just from going out every day. Mm-hmm. Like we'd be like, "Hey, we're just gonna go to Roswell." Like, "Hey, we're gonna go here." We're just we're just gonna go on. The, we're just gonna go digging. We're right. just gonna go out and find some records. Yeah. Um, and use kind of connections that Del Del and we'd be like, "Oh, I got a buddy, or I got a friend." There's a this romance person. to that. That's really cool. Yeah, you know. So like, and then people people in the city were starting to catch wind that we were there to buy records. So then, you know, so Don and Delbert tried to get in phone calls like, oh, hey, I got a buddy here. Uh-huh. I got a buddy there. And so we would follow these leads, right? I got like, I got like a big old buck knife. This is a badass me. movie, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Jamin got some really cool like Kiss sneakers that were worth like 600 bucks for free. You know, anyways. So we go out to eat dinner with these guys. And, like, you know, we just kind of, we were there for a while. So we kind of created a little... A little family. I met this little. I met this guy who was the helper, and I went and smoked weed with him. And then everybody freaked out that I left with him, and they were basically like, "No, you should never leave with this dude ever." <laughs> oh, and I'm just like, we went to some dude's house. It was crazy. It was crazy. I, I think back, and I'm just like, dude, I can't believe you got you got away with all that. So, anyways, we get back to the hotel. So back to the story. So we get back to the hotel. Jamie and I get back to the hotel with with the two record cases, the two shoot, suitcases. And the suitcases are old. Like these are like some antique old suitcases. And we're going through them and everything's just cooked. Just garbage, 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 garbage. So we're throwing them out. And in the suitcases, it has a uh it has a false bottom hmm. in the suitcase. Like no a built way. in like a built in false bottom, right? Oh shit. Uh-huh. Jackpot. <laughs> we pull the we pull the false bottom lid and there's more records in there. All the records in there were all um they were all rockabilly records they were all texas country like rockabilly Sick. records stupid money really how oh. much we, how much are you talking roughly uh just just and it's really funny because like here's the thing too right is that like this is the this is the type of thing where jamin is knowledgeable right and that's the thing about these trips right is that, and that's the beautiful thing about about dave is that like he was able to recognize and understand what people's strong points are and how to take advantage of that and let them ma- maximize the potential out of their, out of what they do best. Mm-hmm. Right. Me, I was the, I'm personable. I'm the sales guy. I'm the friendly, I'm the face. I don't have the knowledge and the depth that say like Jamin or Dave has. I have more than the average person, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but when it comes to a whole other level, these guys are the ones that know. They're doing and, like science, chemistry. Yeah. But yeah, at the yeah. same time, these are also the guys that I get to learn from. Right. You were there right? for the experience. So, oh, I get, yeah. so I get to learn from all this and say, okay, next time I see this label or this record or this variation, like I know to pay attention to it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. The, the other day, this like, quick, quick side note, this guy called the other day about drum and bass records. I don't really know a whole lot about drum and bass records other than like having to listen to them. I can listen to something and know that it's hot. But when somebody brings me in a pile of drum and bass records, I can't sit there and listen to every single one of them. Right. So there has to be ways that you can figure out right away what's the hot shit and what's not the hot shit. Mm -hmm. So I call Dave. Dave, I got a deal on these drum and bass records. And he gives me the sauce right away. Mm. He says, what you want is you want UK and you want early 90s. If it's not UK and if it's not early 90s and if it's not white label, don't even bother with it. That's fire advice. That makes it so simple. So yeah. so now I can go through and I can look at the label, figure out what year it is. I can know whether it's a UK – because I can figure out whether it's a UK press or a US. I, I, I can figure You tell the out. difference. Yeah. And so I'm able to make – so Dave is so calls. Dave is the guy, right? So in this case, so back to the records in the suitcase. Mm-hmm. Jamin is super knowledgeable – on R and B records, popcorn records, uh, titty shaker records. Okay, um, and these are all Favorite these are all like music. these are all crazy little sub. These this is straight record nerd shit. Like, titty shakers, straight record nerd shit. <laughs> <laughs> the and Maraca it's, bouncers. And it's and it's and well, it, they and shake it, their titties though. And it goes see. And the, but the thing is, right, is that like that's what most people think. But when you really get down to it, it has a little bit something to do with the is it way because it's your swing with maybe like the rhythm, the tempo, of, with the yeah. rhythm of the song. That makes uh, sense, actually. Right, like the way that you. So it all makes sense when you really break it all down. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Of course, it's really funny to hear stuff like that. <laughs> it's, hilarious. Yeah. it's hilarious, right? You know, but you tell a record, I get it. No, but you tell a record head that, like, they know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, you know what I mean. Or yeah. They say like a sock hop party, like you know exactly the type of records they're talking about. Mm-hmm. So Jamin is extremely knowledgeable 
in these types of records. Like this is what this is his wheelhouse. This is his strong point. Really. And so he's going through and he's like, yes, 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 yes. Mm-hmm. And so that's probably a couple thousand dollars worth of like nice. rare rockabilly forty five for two hundred bucks. In the, so we scored. <laughs> so we won. W. You know what I mean? So yeah, so it was a dub, you know. Um but you know, there's sometimes there's losses, but you know, the I yeah, think in any course. I think for any um for anybody that's in business for themselves, like you have to realize that you're gonna have losses, but you have to minimize how many you have to minimize the losses. Like you don't want a whole lot of losses. Right. You can have them every once in a while, but you don't want a whole lot. I think lot the same thing about life. There's times where you're yeah. going through a backslide a little bit and I'm just like it's okay, except that it's a backslide, but just like minimize. For instance, one thing that I'll do when I'm things are going like wrong is i'll eat like shit and i'm like tell myself like hey don't just fucking just start making every mistake you possibly can just because you're you're downsliding a little bit let's like taper off some of this backslide right here but i feel like that's translatable just not from just like your diet or your life but business anything you know what i'm saying yeah yeah Mm -hmm. yeah exactly so um but yeah so that was that was the that was that was the the new mexico story so we wound up getting we finally ended up getting but the problem, I, I realized that the problem that we had and the reason why we couldn't get anybody to pick the records up was because it was so far off of a normal path that anybody, that any of these truckers would drive. None of them would really go to this part of New Mexico. They would just kind of like, they'd hit Santa Fe or they'd hit yeah. the major cities and then, you know, hit the next major Texas city. Yeah. So like we were in this like kind of no man's land like type area where like it was really difficult. And so we wound up getting the records. Uh, we get them back to the shop and... uh and it was even crazier because – so now all the records we buy are in the Austin store, but they're in, like, the back room. And so we have to we have to organize the boxes in a maze so that we can walk through the back room. So there's, like, a maze of boxes. I think we stacked them five high and so many deep. And so we created like an this – episode of Hoarders. Yeah, so we created this maze of, you know, to get into the back room of, like, boxes of records. And then I had to go through it and breaking down. And then I had to learn, okay, so how do you break down 30, 40,000 records? Oh, how long did it take you? Um, That took us probably about two or three months. Damn. It's all but, work. But, but the thing was, was that like that, we bought that collection in preparation for the San Antonio store. Mm-hmm. So we went and bought a whole new collection because we weren't going to be able to completely take everything out of the Austin. Because the Austin, so, so in a, more more to the story. So what I didn't realize is, is that we were losing the lease at the Austin store. So we had been in Austin since 2006, and we're now in 20, 2016, and things are beginning to pop off in Austin. The markets for the real estate is beginning to change. You know, we were in an undesirable place. We were in, we were off South Congress, but we were in a back alley, like behind a candy store. Like you had to go like through an alley, like up a ramp, down a set of stairs, like to the left. Mm -hmm. And then there was this like dingy, dusty, like basement kind of area. And that's where I've seen suites like that on South Congress where it's like really kind of out of the way. Yeah. And so that's where the record shop was. You know what I mean? Um, And at this point now, what was once affordable now became really, you know, they wanted like 14 grand damn, to be back there. And we were just like, what are you talking about? Damn. What are you talking about? Like, no way. So then that's when Dave was, and then, so I come along. So the timing of every, now that, you know, now that everything's played out, looking back on it, like the timing of everything, just, it just kind of just happened perfectly. So, so Dave knew that he was, he was going to be losing the location in San Antonio. So he started planning his next move. He decided, and he, he decided that he was going to go work for a bigger record guy. There's a guy out of Portland, um, has a company called Records by Mail. Records by Mail is like the original first ever record by mail service. Mm-hmm. So he's had this since like I think the 70s, maybe the 80s. Damn. And, and Craig's got a warehouse full of records. Wow. But the thing about Craig is is that Craig will only buy records if they're minty fresh. Minty. Crispy clean, right? We were talking about these terms, right? <laughs> so got now a warehouse know. of crispy clean records? Peppermint mocha. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So he'll only buy records if they're immaculate condition. But he's also like top dog. He has more money probably than everybody else. He's the know. one. He's he, the he, one he, one. He can go and buy. You know, he has the power. But he's he's not everybody has the knowledge and expertise that Dave has. So Dave's the type of person where Dave will champion records. I'm he sure makes if, them hot? Yeah. 
Nice. He'll Culture make, pusher. He'll make them hot, and then he'll determine the market for That's it sick. as well. <laughs> yeah, kind because of, yeah. because chances are he went and found three hundred copies, mm. bought all of them, said this is a hot record. Nobody yeah. knows. I have enough influence to tell everybody this is a hot record, and I can make this a three hundred dollar record. Because to me, it sounds like a three hundred dollar record. He's probably right, you know. And he does it, and I've seen him do it wow. several, several, several. He just has times. that ear for it, or what? Several times. Right. Um, That's badass, dude. Yeah. Right. I mean, and I can even give you a story of a local San Antonio record that we did that with. Really? Yeah. Damn. Um, that's so that's crazy. Dave, right? So he's, uh, he's almighty. Like he's like, I, oh, I owe him so much. Yeah. Um, the best mentor I probably could have ever had, but I found that in, in my path, in my career, um, whenever I needed the mentor, it showed up, you nice. know, there's that saying, like the, the teacher will show when the student is ready. When the student is ready, the right, master will appear. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it drops so, down from the roof. And so, <laughs> oh, bye. Like, and so it What's happened. What's your dream, kid? Here's your dream, kid. <laughs> Yeah, so what's you know, like a movie, bro? For real, what I want to write this TV show. The characters <laughs> so, are compelling. So, uh, so when why's that guy from New York? Hey, was, kids. Hey, kid, how you doing? Yeah, and uh, and so I realized, and this was actually the second time this has happened to me because prior to this, I was a DJ. Go I, DJ. I, had, I wanted to be a DJ. Like as a kid, that was my goal. I wanted to be a DJ. Like I wanted to be in music. Like it was a big part of my life. Uh, I was collecting records. Wanted to be a DJ. Couldn't make it in San Antonio. Moved to Houston. Um, kind of. Just kind of was in this limbo space in Houston. Decided to move to Austin to become a DJ. I was like, I'm going to Austin to be a DJ. That's why I'm going. They love music out there. I get to Austin. Yeah, I get to Austin. Uh, luckily, I get I I, uh, I meet a guy named Jim Bradford, uh, and Jim Bradford's like you know in his fifties. You know, he's like a he's like a uh, he's a um, He's a punk, you know. He's like he's like he's like a like a, like a, like a I'm forgetting the, all, all these all the terms and the names are rockabilly me now. But no, he was he's a skinhead. He's a skinhead. Oh, whoa! But like, but not like, but not like. <laughs> so okay, so okay, so here's check this out. So when I say that, <laughs> so when I say that, it has a negative connotation, right? Because immediately I thought the same thing, right? uh -huh. but. More like a ska skinhead, so they're like anti-fascist. They're anti this. They're anti. It's like a skinhead. Things. Skinhead. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a whole other thing. Right? Punk only. And punk. so like, just punk. And so there's a whole other punk, like not politics. So there's like a whole like <laughs> subgenre of like all these people that are into different types of music and they identify with a certain thing. And so that's yeah. how that's how they do, you know. And so Jim would wear you know the suspenders and the, the Ben Davis shirts. You know what I mean? The okay. Jeans and the Doc Martens. And, it's like a uniform. But Jim was like one of the nicest dudes ever. Like super, super, super nice. He was a, Jim was a vegetarian. <laughs> okay. Jim was like a 60-year-old, 50-year-old vegetarian. And he had been a vegetarian for like 30 years. You know what I mean? So he was just an interesting guy. guy. And so I was able to meet Jim. And Jim mentored me. Jim said, hey, you want a DJ? And I'm like, yes. And he says, okay. He says, look, I'll help you. He says... But as soon as I hear you fucking roll your eyes or as soon as I hear you, because if I tell you something, he says, I'm not helping you anymore. And I looked at him and I go, um, okay. He says, because if you already knew this, you wouldn't be here asking me for my help. Mm -hmm. I said, fair enough. I need you to be a student. Yeah. I said, fair enough. He says, okay, cool. He says, grab those records and let's fucking go. So I had to carry records around. I had to. Fucking, he was like, I need you to go to this place and I need you to walk the records to the bar down the street. You know, and he says, and then he'd be like, hey, um, okay, so this is an XLR. This is a quarter inch. This is an RCA. Um, do you know how to, do you know what any of those cables do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Type and so shit, he mentored yeah. me and he taught me um, how to balance sound. You know, I mean, I would, I would walk into DJ parties and it behind the scenes was the most chaotic thing ever. You know, you show up to a, uh, you show up to a restaurant. I showed up to a gig one day. I'll never forget this. I showed up to a DJ gig. I show up. It's packed. He's got the whole place jamming. And I'm like, oh man, I'm going to walk right into the party. This is going to be great. Mm -hmm. I walk in and I look at Jim and he's got this look on his face, like just terror, you know? <laughs> and I'm just like, and he goes, sit there. He says, you're not DJing tonight. And I was like, oh shit. Okay. So I sit there and I just start watching what's going on. And then he basically tells me that he's only getting sound out of one turntable, but the sound 
that the turntable is coming from is switching. So sometimes it's this one and sometimes it's this one. Mm. No way. No. Yeah. Yeah. And then he says, he goes, I've been battling with it all night. He says, he says, the he goes, the PA system here is the most like ghetto house rig thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Oh, no. He says, I had to like splice and put a cable and jerry rig some stuff to make it work. He says, so of course it's not working. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> And I'm just like sitting there and I'm just like, what is going on? And he's so he's explaining to me and as he's telling me that I'm just like, oh gosh, like that's that's like that that kills the party. Like that's done, done deal. And his and oh. and, and the party is jumping. He has the whole thing going off. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there and I'm like, how the fuck are you doing this? And he looks at me and he says, He has this, and then and then I kind of look at him and I go, Jim, what like how the, and he has this big old smile on his face and he goes, he grabs this record, right? He goes this right here and i look at him and it's a it's a studio 54 extended dance mix so what it is is it's a record that's already pre-mixed so there's no gaps and no pauses in between anything mm-hmm. so he doesn't nice. have to flip and he looks at me and he says i carry this record just for these moments he goes i will never play this record because it's a because it's not me DJing. Mm. Yeah, it's already it's a playlist. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. already a sad plug playlist. Plug you know, he it's says a song. <laughs> he says, but I keep this record just in case I have an issue where I only have access to one turntable. And so he just lesson learned. And I just sit there and I was gem. like, what a wow. gem of a I lesson. Like, I was like, wow, dude. I was like, wow, okay. So going back to like I said, like I've always been lucky and I've always had those mentors. And for me, I feel that. That's why, for me, I feel that this has kind of been like a, just a natural progression and a natural yeah. path for me. And the funny thing is, is that I've been able to take back, take, take all of the, the lessons and all of the things that I learned from the hospitality industry, working in restaurants, grinding with John, you know, working in the trenches as trenches, John, baby. as John likes to, to describe it, um, you know, the lessons learned from the managers that I worked for, you know, even like the jerk asshole manager that that fired me or wrote me up for something when Nobody it wasn't likes. my fault or it was a kitchen <laughs> issue and it wasn't a serve. You know what I mean? I remember all, him. all those mm-hmm. all those types of things. Right. They all kind of put me in a position because the funny thing that ends up happening is, is when you get into something real specialized like DJing or records or computers, mm-hmm. people that are real specialized in those things are really not very social because they're so like the record nerd guy is probably not the most social guy. Hmm. Right. So yeah. I come in and I'm like, Hey, <laughs> I love records and I'm friendly and I'll talk to you and I'm not going to act like a jerk when you bring the Madonna record. You'll, right. You'll think it. Right. <laughs> I'll think it. Right. But then that goes back to what I was saying earlier. Right. Is that like, I also had to get over this ego of like, once I had access to the, Oh, yo, you got, I got that Charmel's 45. It's, you know, it's on the Volt white label promo. Y'all are looking like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> what, right? Chinese. Like, what you exactly, know about right? that? What you, you right. don't know you nothing know about I mean? that. So, totally different language. You know, getting, mm-hmm. getting, fire, though. you know, and then, and, but also like having to bring myself like down, right? Having to like check myself. Um, um, and it happened DJing. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it because I realized DJing. So I had this story. Okay. So I'm DJing Austin. And I'm and I and I was and I was able to make it like very well as a DJ. Like I got really fortunate, and I, was, and I think about this right: blessings, being thankful, being appreciative um, for everything that you have, even when you don't have anything. It's still important to say, you know what? There's still so much more that I have, right? Because you think about perspective. Mm. You know, somebody else's perspective. Somebody else can look at you and be like, "Damn, you look like a millionaire." Their perspective, you are. Right, because of what mm-hmm. you have compared to what they don't have, right? So, like, there's always a perspective, right? So, hey, gratefulness is like a tool it's you have. Huge. To use. It's and it's something that it's something that I. It's taken me a long time to learn that, and not only like learn it and understand it, but put it into practice. Big time, yeah. Right, that's because it. it's one thing like understanding something or saying, "Oh, yeah," like being appreciative. Yes, like, that's great. Okay, like put it into play. Mm-hmm. Like really put it into practice. Right. And see how it changes things. Right. So I'm doing this DJ gig and I was really thankful because I was able to to, to DJ uh, in Austin. So I did. I would DJ Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, sometimes two gigs on Sundays. And they were paying me three hundred dollars a gig. Dang. I was making that every week. Nice. Just DJing. 
That's crazy. Going from serving, that's like going from yeah. serving to doing that, and then the jump from serving and quitting my job to DJing. Like I did a bunch of South by Southwest parties. There's a whole whole other bunch of stuff that you know that I haven't had. That I probably won't, probably won't have time to get into, but um. So I got really fortunate, and I'm DJing on Rainy Street in 2017, 2000, no, 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 2013, 2014, 2015. This is like heyday at Rainy Street. This is like when Rainy was popping yeah, yeah. off, mm -hmm. and I was the Friday night, Saturday night DJ. Nice. You know, so I got – it was a very humbling thing as well, right, because there's also – you start getting into late night activities. You start getting into that. <laughs> To that other type of lifestyle. I was gonna say it's a lifestyle. That for lifestyle real. that yeah. comes with it, right? Yeah. The trap. You know, the huge, you know, the the super rich millionaire guy who's there for tech week in Austin and loves your DJ set and is inviting you to come party at the penthouse and keep the party going. You know, and you're waking up at you're there and it's five, six AM and you're looking around and you're just like <laughs> What is going on? I don't I really you know what I mean? But there's also that like you're the DJ, right? So for me, it was a, I had, I had moments, I'm not going to lie. I had moments where I had to be humbled. I had to be brought back. I had, somebody had to pop that bubble hmm. that was my head and say, Hey dude, you, you need to, you need, you need to come down to fuck back to fucking earth here, bro. You know, um, there was many instances and many uh, things that happened. And I had to say, Hey, if you want to continue to do this, you have to, you have to have this job and do this with responsibility. Hmm. Like, yeah, you know, every once in a while, go go party. You know, go have go have a wild night. But dog, can't be doing that every it's weekend, the balance. bro. Yeah, it's it can't happen every weekend, right? Because here I am, I'm living my dream. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a DJ. Here I am, but now it's also being threatened because of vices, because of habits, because mm -hmm. of temptations, because of all these things, right? And so it was a very humbling thing for me. And and what this kind of leads to is like so I'm DJing one one day and there's this girl it's a su Sunday fun day and the bar is really not that busy and so this girl comes up and she's asking me for like a, a Miley Cyrus song or something and so by this point I had already party in the USA yeah it was mm -hmm. something I think it was I think that was actually it actually <laughs> it had to be it's one of the number one songs yeah like. <laughs> so so um. And I had already made the transition. I had already gotten over myself being a vinyl DJ and transitioning into a digital DJ. Mm -hmm. I did it, right? I remember some of you earlier, that yeah. whole separation. I did it. I made the transition because I was like, you know what? Nobody cares that you're playing a rare record. No one gives a they shit. They just want to shake the titties. No one gives a shit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I, so I decided, hey, if you want to be a professional DJ and you want to make this your career, you're going to have to transition. You're going to have to give in a little bit. So I gave in. So I played, so I played fucking okay, Miley Cyrus. Yeah. Played the damn You got to adapt. Cyrus. You got to adapt. Played the Miley Cyrus. But yeah. something happened when I played that Miley Cyrus song. Okay. <laughs> you died on the inside. <laughs> I, I, I'm sitting there playing this Miley Cyrus song, watching this girl have the absolute time of her life, singing the songs. And the, the feeling that I'm getting from her is pure joy. Totally. Pure love. I was going to say, honestly. She's just having the absolute best time. And in that moment, it all hit me. It all hit me. Fulfillment. It was like, hey, dude, the way that that girl feels right now is the exact same way that you feel when you hear this rare record. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. The feeling is the exact fucking same. So why are you going to act like a fucking snob about it? Yeah, why would you like try to withhold that from somebody else the if you have the power the to, same. to not? The yeah. feeling is the same. You got the same joy. And at the end of the day, really, when it all comes down to it, the person who – because we didn't write these songs. I didn't write these records. Mm. I, well, why am I going to sit here and be like gatekeeping type shit, mm. right? Yeah, like, yeah. Cause this ain't mine. To some term. degree, it's your responsibility to make her to feel To share that. it, exactly, yeah, right? Yeah. And so I realized in that moment, right, the person that wrote this song wrote it with emotions. It came from a place. There was feelings. And with me being so nerdy and so caught up in this ego, I lost sight of all that. Mm. I lost sight of like where it all really came from. It didn't come from, oh, this is a rare record because it wasn't a rare record when it was made. Mm. It was made out of somebody's story, emotion, right. a, a feeling, some pain, joy, whatever, whatever the song was, you know, like, you know, mm -hmm. and, and as artists and as an artist, 
that's where the creativity comes from. It comes from your experiences. It comes from your pain. It comes from your joy. It comes from, comes from all those, the things that happened to you when you were a little kid. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, because a lot of times, you know, as, as an artist or when you're a musician or something, all those trauma and all those things, that's what winds up being the first thing that you express. A lot of times, yeah. Right. You, it's your first time expressing yourself. Right. It's that, it's, it's that saying, you had your whole life to write your first album. Now you got to write your second album in two months. Bryson Tiller got him. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's just like all those experiences or they all came from somewhere. Right. So I realized it in that moment, I was like, dude, you've been missing, you've been missing the point this whole time, mm -hmm. you know? And dude, so I love party in the USA, to be honest with you. <laughs> like I, I legitimately, it, that song banger. brings me joy. Like I remember so, being in the car with like my mom and my sister when I was like 16 and that song comes on and I start being like getting kind of loose with them and they're like laughing. And then I'm like, put my hands up. And then they start singing with me. And like, now when I hear that song in the club, I still go nuts. You know what I'm saying? Because it evokes a memory, right? Right, yeah, exactly. And that's, what, and that's what I realized is that up to that point, I had gotten so caught up in the rarity and the, mm. the physical. The I got caught up in the physical. I got caught up in the, this thing right here is worth a thousand dollars. And it, you know, it's because it's a rare, because it's a rare record. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? Like, how does that, how does it make you feel? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it makes me feel great. But it may not make anybody else feel great. But how can I take that same feeling away from somebody else who gets that, even if it's from a Miley Cyrus song? Hundred percent. You know what I mean? So I had time to, in place. Like I don't, yeah. I don't want you to be too hard on yourself because I that's, think that's that's what I'm thinking. There's a balance yeah. because there's a a proper place for your discernment and your experience. And one of the things I love about George is conviction. That's whack. Mm -hmm. No way. That looks good on you. Oh, that hat's terrible, but it looks good on you. Yeah, that's what no, I, I want to like, hear that. But like, I love his passion and conviction. I, I feel like George is important to the culture here in town. And, and I respect you and love you for all that because you know, like immediately as an artist, what makes you move and what, what makes you uh, not. And, and there's correlations with wine, like the I was gonna say, major yeah. correlations. And we were just talking recently and, and I hadn't really even thought about this, right. but like the table wine that everybody loves and the, the Mayomis, like there's a place for every wine. There's a place for every record, right? And right. you're talking about the, the joy that someone has. So I can have my conviction, Right. Mm -hmm. But for who am I to gatekeep and angrily and diminish with my little toll booth of I'm, this is my authority. Like, right. get out of here, dude. Right. So I, I love that about yeah, you. I mean, so, you know, and so the more that I talk to people um, and especially like um, creatives, um, those, those are my people. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we, we all share a, a kind of a similar story. And I think that in order to be an artist and in order to be a creative, there's like a vulnerability that comes there. But there also is like being able to tap into that. And touch that, which people are afraid to do that. For people sure. don't want to do that, you know. And that's where all the that's where all the magic, happens. especially men in the last fifty years, absolutely go with the crowd. Absolutely, yeah, hard, hard to be vulnerable and emotional and connect with people sometimes because we want to be like real, like tough and no, I don't cry, you know. And and I think I want to be both. <laughs> I know, kick ass. I yeah, for sure. Both, but for I'm sure. vulnerable. And I think too, like also, like for me, like what you just kind of touched on. Um, for me, being being Chicano, like it's part of the culture. Yeah. I've right. heard that. I don't like know, but like it's, yeah, like yeah. it's part of the culture. You sure. know what I mean? Like, you know, I mean, I remember my dad saying plenty of like, ah, stop being a pussy. Mm. My you dad did tell mean? me that a lot. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, as opposed to just being like, hey, where's this emotion coming from? Yeah. Right. But like, these are things that, you know, you, you're a kid, you, you know, you it's just, a balance too. You just kind of deal with it. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's been, it's been, um, it's been, yeah, it's been interesting. I feel you. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. It, it sounds seems, like your, yeah, like your life story is like tailor made for you. Like the, the timing of everything and running into these characters, like a, like a like movie esque. You know, it's like just certain conversations and being in the right place at the right time. And ultimately, like I'm, I'm, I'm realizing now how appreciative and how thankful I need to be for all these things. Yeah. Right. Like we go back to it. Right. Like it's, it's huge. Like yeah. I think about like, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm hearing myself tell this story, and to me, it's just, it's, it's just, just it's your life. Yeah. But hearing seeing the way y'all are reacting to it and you're just like, well, that's fucking crazy. Like yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm thank you. Like, thank you for fucking thinking my story's cool. It <laughs> is. It is that. I low key want to talk to you about writing a TV show about this. I think if we had people that went like you and homie went to different places to buy records and you ran into this like crazy backwoods papa with the shotgun lady. And it's just like the, the kind of adventures that you would go on, going to find records and bring oh, them back to the record store. Would that's a cool TV show. You know, the correlations, the American pickers and they go and find the Corvette in the barn and stuff like yeah, that. Right. You know, and they meet the, they meet the, yeah. her, the hermit dude who's created his own little cavern of, of newspapers and art and, you know, 
stop signs and whatever. And that, you know, and it's funny now. I'm sitting here. I'm beginning to think of all the that. That was just that's just one. That's just one story. You right. You know what I mean? I'm like sure. there's there's plenty of other stories of like digging and being on the road. And you know, like I said, it's I think back on it. And when I do when I do tell the story and people look, especially like people in the record shop, you know, they'll ask and they're like, "Wait, you got paid to like." travel and just buy records i'm like yeah and they just and i can see them like just light up that's a scene on their face you know what i mean and you know but 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 one thing that that's happened um and i don't want to say that this is like the 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 negative side or the bad side um but if anything maybe it's um for anybody that might be listening or anybody that's thinking to themselves like well, I want to. I want to follow my passion, and I and, and I want to do what I love, and and, and make it how I live. Um, there's you're talking about balance earlier, John. Um, there's a huge, huge amount of balance that has to go into that because what what I've found, if I'm being completely on 100 percent with you, is that I got really burnt out. Like the record shop was like everything, like everything, everything, every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. Every day. And so slowly things things started to kind of get chipped away, right? And what I mean by like, I'll give you an example. Um, I love it when somebody comes into the store. I can be, I can be on the, uh, they can be on the opposite side of the, of the room and I can, they're digging. And when I hear somebody go, <gasps> hmm. right? Or they say, oh, they have this. Or that 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 feeling, like like I got goosebumps. Like look at my arms. Like I got goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, you do. Like, like, I'm not like, no even lie. just like, drawing no this feeling. Lie. Yeah, right. So That's magic. Like, so like when I hear that, I'm just like yeah. immediately. I'm like, what'd you find? <laughs> right. Like what'd you like? What'd you find? What'd you find? What'd you find? And for me, and this is almost, it's sad. Right. Is that I I can't get that feeling for myself. I don't mm. I don't go to other record shops and dig and look for records that I've been chasing for because I have my own store now and chances are I'll just, it'll just, it'll just pop up in there. Mm -hmm. It'll just show up. Mm -hmm. Right. So like that, that like <laughs> pretty cool deal. You're, yeah. Yeah. You're but, robbed. Yeah. yeah but yeah, I'm robbed of that, of that but, I'm, but I'm robbed of that thing that almost is the thing that drives you to do it. The ah, discovery. The, right. I think it's that just, feeling. Right. And even so on a sub subconscious primordial level, like our caveman instinct to hunt, find and bring back the thing that we'd been sure. imagining we could go get. Right. I found a berry bush. Right. right I think that fuels right. a lot of our testosterone, serotonin, dopamine, the things that balance us. Absolutely. Dude, I have a small correlation. So I did improv for a minute. I was part of a troupe. And, yeah. and I was I performed a few shows at the River Center, and I had this one moment where they had this thing called Poet's Corner. So, you know, they set the mood and turn the lights down, and everybody snaps instead of clapping, right? And you get two words, and I got logarithms and the afterlife, and like, and, and go. Logarithms? Like a logarithms, TI-84? <laughs> like, like mathematical equations okay, and, right. and the afterlife, <laughs> the and go. And so... I got up on stage and I, how y'all doing? My name's Cornelius. How about, how, <laughs> oh, cool, cool. I said, how about another round of snaps, right? And so I'm just buying myself a little time because I'm tripping. My right? dog ate my but homework and dropped the logarithm. <laughs> this is why I do the thing because I'm, I'm, you know, I, and I'll tell you, I, I'm not Excel spreadsheets. I'm, I'm, I suck at a bunch of different things. I, you know, um, my time management, no. So I can tell you, so, so you know, I'm not cocky, right? But this is what I was living for because I'm, I'm quick with it, right? So I, I went into this thing. I was like, you know, here I sit on a cloud, try to make mom and dad proud. Uh, wasn't good at math, you see, because I failed out at chemistry. And then, and, and then I tried to rhyme logarith logarithms and finished with logarithms. And I laughed at myself and the audience <laughs> died laughing because it was so absurd. There was no way. Right. And then I and then I finished. I said one plus one, two plus two. Dr. Seuss said red fish blue and the whole place fell out. Oh! It, it, it was it, it like stuck the landing. Mary Lou Rett, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. right? And then at the end of the show, the guy who had the ownership of the troupe came up to me and wanted to know about that moment. Like, what was that like for you? Because in many cases, like this is the reason for the correlation that he had gone into his passion and he didn't have that anymore. 
You know, he'd been, you know, it's like drug use and your tolerance is, is going up and you don't quite get the same. So he was jazzed on that moment and I was alive. I was so alive. Lit. And I, mm-hmm. I, I mean, just all energy, just raw energy ex- exploding from my chest, you know, just that feeling of fulfillment, you know? Yes. So that's, wow. that's the correlation about, about yeah. balance, right? Mm-hmm. About having that. And when you do it again and again, you know, like you, when you when you start hitting champ you know game winning championship shots it's at some point or you know do they lose their luster hell no <laughs> okay, okay. Game, that's why they brought me here Come but on. did you see Dwayne Wade's the face uh, statue it's, it's, it's bad like oh, it looks it's horrible. bad it's horrible it's bad it's terrible. Terrible. For that guy, <laughs> who is that there was who the hell is that this is the <laughs> second time it happened the other one was do you guys remember there like th- th- three or four months ago Come, yeah yeah who was it man do you remember I forget Alan Iverson N- no. no there's no. another statue that was a yeah, that was pretty bad. Yeah. 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 No, they had to redo it. NBA? NBA? It was NBA? Yes. Oh. It wasn't Michael Jordan, and, was it? And no. I think, older and I think, person? I think even the player was just kind of like... Was it? Mm, yeah, he was, right? Was like, we, can look look it up. No, no. we can look it up. I'm, yeah, I'm struggling. Dwayne Wade for Chardonnay. I know I saw that yeah, one that recently. Well, that just happened. That His was jaw was... <laughs> He looks. He looks like wide. He looks like yeah. super. No, like no, it's his weird. Face his head's like, like a rhombus. I saw some stuff where it looks like like Teal'c from uh, from Stargate. <laughs> his face is all fat. Oh, so yeah, it looks it looks pretty it rough. Pretty bad. I want to say it was like it wasn't Dirk, was it? Christi- no, 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 no. Cristiano no, no. Ronaldo has one no. as bad, I guess. But I remember seeing Cristiano's. David Beckham's got a bad one. No, it was hoops. It was a basketball. It was basketball yeah. for sure. Okay, this yes. Is, this one's basketball players, I think. <laughs> it was oh, so bad. I've got basketball players. Uh, yeah, it was pretty bad. Oh, that's rough. Man. That's like, not even crazy. close. Mm-hmm. <laughs> was it Ray Allen? No. uh Football stage? Uh, let's see. It was definitely somebody deserving yeah, right. a statue. Hall of Fame player. I think this is fun because the, the audience is trying to remember themselves right now. Or they, or they already know it. Yeah. <laughs> <He's> telling us. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't tell you. I definitely it was it was within a couple years. It was within it the was last recent. five years. Yeah, it was recent. Might be the worst ever. Maybe they'll have some kind of comparison to the past. Remember when this happened? Come on, Barstool. Oh, <laughs> oh God. It's tough, bro. Dwayne Wade, no. It Who looks is like that? Zeus. Yeah, it the looks Zeus like Zeus fucking hoops. Thanos. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough. The rest of the statues, like it, that's the money moment. Him on the when table, him on the table, and yeah. that's good, yeah. right? Yeah. But the, saying, that like, is not is his my, face. This is my town. Or yes, something, right. This is my town. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, that's rough. And I think there's some things that that I I don't dig on D Wade. But how can you argue with a pure moment like that? Like jump up on the scores table, all motion. Uh, it was sick. My house, game winner, bro. I right? Don't think, had you ever game seen anyone winner. jump on the score tables before? I had it. No, not maybe not Kobe. Like, like, did Kobe do that? No, I, I don't think so. No, Kobe. Is, I think they started uh, doing it after yeah. he was uh, <laughs> all heart. Uh, Whoa! That's, that's your crazy. favorite, right, Kobe? That's my, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's my that's dog. Guy. That's my guy, man. Yeah. Definitely, definitely cried when he passed. Mm. I didn't fall in love with him until after that, actually, when I was like really trying to be somebody, and I was like, "This is what Kobe's about." I remember I was driving to the gym at like two in the morning after I'd. Gone to a work shift and I was just like not giving up on the lift. I'm going in. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I felt like I felt Kobe Bryant like sitting in the car next to me because right. I've been reading about him and watching his videos and his quotes for a few months now. And I felt him sitting right there with the hoodie zipped up to his chin, arms crossed, big old legs in my car. Just <laughs> like, let's go get it. <laughs> Got to <laughs> conquer it. Got to conquer that feeling. Like putting that work, boy. And then dude, I, I did I not like work, Kobe. Boy. I didn't like his bravado, and, mm-hmm. and because he was up against a lot of my. My heroes, it, you know, it was like I, I loved the bullets and it was C. Webb and Juwan Howard and those boys. And, and so they, there was some stuff back and forth. But then I also got um, when I moved here, my ex's family had season tickets to the Spurs. So I saw Tony Parker and Manu and Ooh, Tim Era battles. Games, right. But later after his career or towards the tail end, because I played a ton of hoops, I started to appreciate his dogged determination uh, not not the you know i am him but you gotta respect the work right yeah. you put in work yeah and if you ever see the compilation where it shows jordan's moves simultaneously with and there's got to be 30 in a row of exact same form turnaround fade uh, yeah, footwork right so you got to respect the work yeah, yeah, that was one. Have you seen the uh, the the Dream Team or no, no, the Redeem Team, the Redeem Team documentary? I think. Uh, the, what was that? Oh eight, LeBron. Yeah, yeah, LeBron. It's and on Netflix. Carmelo, like Bosh, minutes. Yeah, and, and Kobe, and then and, and he was... said the very first play, I'm running through power. I'm running through that motherfucker. And, they all, and they're, <laughs> and they're all like, huh? 
and and the message was set high screen. Right? He came and destroyed him. Powell was like, huh? And everybody's like, yeah, USA. <laughs> we are not homies, he's right? right? He's, he's gonna say yeah. high message screen. received. I'm gonna run through his fucking chest. Yes, and, <laughs> and he did. <laughs> he did one of those impacts where you put through the person. Yeah. <gasps> Ooh. yeah. yeah. Fucking I got love how Gasol in the interview on the documentary is just like, yeah, you know, I got the message. <laughs> it's like he wasn't mad. He didn't want to fight him. He's just like, he was letting me know we're not. Yeah, cool they were today. they were teammates. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, they I might have been kind of pissed. They dude. were fam. Yeah, but I, I love. I think LeBron was telling that story because they were surprised. Oh yeah, everybody by the, was the, like, what like the oh, fuck? okay, dude, it's like damn. that. Yeah, it's like that. Yeah, that part. And then there was another. I guess uh, just his his work ethic. You know what I'm saying? That, that was another thing. Another thing that everyone was kind of talking about because they were in Vegas training for it with Coach K, and then they were waking up at like six, seven. He was already and there. he was already done. He had already worked out for two hours by seven a.m. They're like, "What the fuck is this guy on? Oh my god!" And then everyone started coming with them. One night they said they were coming back home from the club at like two, three, four in the morning, and Kobe was already in the gym, waking the, up, heading the to the gym. Day. Yeah, I saw him in the elevator. I think on the way to the gym, they were going, they were going, they were going to and sleep, he was, and he was going to work. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> and they were just like, "Ah, oh, shit." All right, I'll, I'll, uh, tomorrow morning I got you. And they just like started locking in with him. I think who's the Carmelo Anthony's the one guy that didn't lock. Wanted he's to like, hold out. He's like, fuck that. I'm not <laughs> working like, out at four. Can, in the can we go at seven? <laughs> <laughs> he's got like one of the, I don't know, his yeah, career. Yeah, but that's like why Carmelo. Yeah, you know, exactly. He never won a ring, right? Yes, no, nope. never won a ring. But he was barely on a team that was great. You know what I'm saying? He was with the Nuggets forever. Then yeah. the Knicks, but the Knicks weren't great during that era. The Nuggies. Yeah, Kobe kept on taking them out. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, about every that year. was a squad though. And when yeah. AI was running with point, AI, and Marcus Camby and J.R. Smith, <laughs> Jesus Smith we used to call him because he could dunk from the three point line. Three sixty in the game. <laughs> it's crazy, bro. Yeah, they made him OP in like two K. 11 or whatever, the whatever fuck it was. Whatever one we played that year, <laughs> J.R. Smith was off the charts. He was nasty. I loved so, D. Wade in high school because I was – I've always been like a uh, bigger kid, super overweight when I was younger. And then I lost weight, but I always was bigger. And then Dwayne Wade was kind of like a guard that was like a bigger guy. And he shot a lot of mid-range. And he would kind of like post people up from the free throw. Keep the space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I felt like he did a really good job of not playing like Allen Iverson. Like, let me try to cross you over because I didn't have the speed to do that. Mm -hmm. But he played with like space, positioning. He rebounded. And then I was kind of like a fan of his gameplay, and then I watched him beat the Mavericks, and I was just like, oh, okay, not only – that can work. That can win championships. I should lock into this and try to – that's why I shoot that mid-range little yeah. – all the time. That's what I didn't like about Melo. Into the chest, up into the chin, bully ball. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then sure. when he went to the Blazers, I just saw a, a, a little clip of him talking about that, and they called an offensive foul on him, and they're like, no, we want you shooting in the corner. <laughs> really? Like, and then he got into his hoodie mellow and you know. oh, so that that was another guy I didn't I I didn't like how cocky he was especially coming out of Syracuse and the way um the way he just the way he carried himself like just one of those characters you know like uh -huh. and I didn't have much of a slice of of information right. like who he is or whatever yeah, yeah, right yeah. but <laughs> just, just snap mm -hmm. snap judgment you know so I'm judging myself by the way, like in, in saying so but um, I bet he wishes he would have done it differently. I don't know. I think there's a there's a threat. In order to be a hooper at that level, you gotta know you're the guy. So, you know, there, sure. there's a certain mm -hmm. there's certain days where I'm you know when I'm jumping around before the game, you know, and I know that I'm better than whoever's coming up against me. You know, you gotta have some of that. Yeah, right? have but will. talking about it, mm -hmm. is, I, I I think that's the thing. Like we were talking about balance before. I truthfully don't right? think you have to be that way. Like I don't think Peyton Manning was ever like walked into the room and was tried to alpha everybody. You know, I mean, I'm sure he was charismatic, but I guarantee you there's a slice beyond his preparation that no, you know, because his his dad was champion, you know. Yeah, true. And so there's a certain level of expectation mm -hmm. where you've got to know you're the guy. Yeah, it's right? a, yeah, and I've true. seen him on the sideline digging in on somebody. Yeah, he'll go off. Right. Yeah. So th that's there. It's but I'm, but so so respect to the person who's got that and yet can exude kindness mm -hmm. right yeah. that's guru mm -hmm. mountain stuff yeah that's all of it yeah True. you gotta be able to do all of it or have a multifaceted this is approach. one of my favorite things about Carmelo Anthony I love that we're watching hoop highlights I love you guys this is sick. yeah man <laughs> this is so sick <laughs> if you can try to listen to what he's saying <laughs> what did he say <laughs> give me that fucking ball <laughs> <laughs> fuck out of here I fuck out of here <laughs> <laughs> that's his favorite one to yell <laughs> I got the fuck out of here. His own teammates. 
<laughs> it's this guy right there. My board. That's his go-to. He doesn't just say mine. He's like, I got it. Fuck out of here. GTFO. One more. <laughs> it's like compulsive. <laughs> Only his teammates are around yeah. him. No one else is around him. Oh god, that's awesome. But yeah, that's a, I, I came across that on an Instagram reel one night. And I was just like, is this a real thing? And if you Google it, it's just like uh, just a known. For a while, he was just screaming every time he got a rebound. <laughs> Dude, that's hilarious. I'm struggling on the statue thing, man. I know. I, 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 I think we're over it. I think we're past the statue. I pulled up the Allen Iverson oh, one. I don't think it was the Allen Iverson <laughs> one. No, that one was just yeah. small, but it, I don't think that was it. Yeah, that one Maybe they scrubbed it from the small. internet. Like, you know how they'll pay money to get mm-hmm. rid of something? Like, they already mm-hmm. redid it. <laughs> yeah, 76ers were like, get rid of that story. I should bury it. I bury like, it. I don't like that loose thread, boys. Derrick Rose? No. He's getting celebrated lately. I don't, the my OCD gets triggered by not finishing. Yeah, I don't know. Topics. Yeah, I don't know who who could have been commemorated. Is that the guy with the biggest peak that had the smallest window? Oh, D Rose, a, his level that he like he was so springy. He reached MVP superstardom in like a season. Which one was worse, nine eleven or Derrick Rose's career? <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding, guys. This is a joke. That more might, tragic. <laughs> that, that might be too soon. <laughs> We're not there yet. What did I say? Wait twenty years and then it's funny. We haven't gotten to twenty years yet. Yeah. We're almost there. Remember, almost. we saw that stand-up comedian, Hoff, there. Hofstetter, oh, yeah. was, mm-hmm. was doing 9-11 jokes. So. Mm-hmm. No, but that's how gentlemen usually feel about Derrick Rose, though, is it, it's just a try. Like, it breaks your heart. Oh, yeah. You for know? sure. Like, he yeah. had made it to the pinnacle. He was like a dog. That was up was against my guy. Wizards. That was up against my Wizards oh. with, with Nene and and um, John Wall and, and Brad Beal was early. Shout out with, Nene. He was on that Nuggets team with AI and Carmelo. He sure was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He sure was. <laughs> the original Manimal before. That's the only reason I know Fareed. him. That's yeah. Cool. yeah, I remember that guy. I remember playing with them in two and, and represent the the Chicanos, Eduardo Nahara. What's up? Nahara. Let's go. <laughs> Nahara. Yeah. He's Dude. a wizard? Nah, he was a nugget. He was a nuggy. Yeah, nice. I think he's from the area. Nice. Nuggets. Badass. Yes, dude. And there was one question I guess I wanted to ask because, because yeah, your story, it's like the, the timing of things. And I think it's like a, we talked with this, or we talked to a couple of different people on our podcast now, like uh, Chris, his barber, uh, his barber, and then also uh, one of my good homies, Austin, and his like medical journey experience in his life, and then his, uh, Chris's barbershop entrepreneurial experience, and then also your experience. It's like, one. Well, I don't know. It's kind of what this podcast is about. It's like chasing your passion and like doing what you want to do. And like, because I feel like everyone kind of has a calling or something coming out to them. So mm-hmm. I mean, it feels like your life has kind of played out and seems to be kind of falling in that manner. Like a movie esque, like a book, you know, like a crazy, crazy story. Whenever you have the hindsight, you're able to connect all the dots and have that perspective of seeing the, the kind of bird's eye view and mm-hmm. how everything played out perfectly. Mm-hmm. Do you think, like, is there anything, like any mindset or any like spirituality or anything that you carry into like your day to day outlook that like think you or that you think may have played a factor into that to like help you get on your path? Um, that's really interesting uh, that you asked that question because what you're talking about specifically hasn't happened until recently. Mm-hmm. Um, during the whole time that I was the story that I told you, um, I was just kind of just going with reacting. things you know what i mean yeah, reacting yeah. and i don't think that i had understood the appreciation thing and the being thankful thing um that has been something that's probably been more this year mm-hmm. than anything else um starting at the beginning of the year uh i went through went through a little breakup you know a little mm-hmm. breakup at the beginning of the year and it really shifted my focus and it really started to have an effect on me when I started thinking about like basically what you're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so now when I wake up every day before I go to bed, you know, I do the, what am I thankful for? Mm. You know, like, Hey, today sucked, right? Like this was bad. That was bad, but I still got a car, mm-hmm. you know, I still got that. Uh, I got that Stussy hat that I really wanted. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I got those Jordans or I got – I have electricity at home. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> like, like clean water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Baseline, something baseline, like baseline, something the like, like the, the basic, basic, basic things, oh, right? Yeah. Like that is very easy to get like things taken for granted, right? 100%. But also but, but also too like understanding and realizing too that like how how everything is so connected, right? Like one of the biggest things that, that for, for me at the beginning of the year – um, after the breakup, right, was like me being like, oh, I was emotional and sad and I was devastated. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, you need to start making changes for for you 
And slowly I started to understand and realize how everything that I had been doing up to this point was keeping me from from really seeing and, and, and enjoying everything that everything else that was going on. Right. And the examples are and the examples were I was drinking too much beer before I went to bed. I was eating water burger and then going to sleep right afterwards. I wasn't sleeping eight hours every day. I did that day. three out of five nights. <laughs> you know, but I was doing I was doing it every day, right? But uh-huh. I also started to rec- recognize and realize like how all those little things were affecting stuff like it was affecting my sleep. If I don't if you don't sleep good and you don't sleep well, you get bags under your eyes. Your skin starts to look bad. Right. And these are all things that I when 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 I left the last relationship, one of the things that my that my ex told me was, and this was something that I carried with me, she says, get back to loving yourself. Right. And I started thinking about those are those are all that that's loving yourself. Getting an adequate amount of sleep. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, brushing your fucking teeth in the morning, combing your hair, cleaning out your belly button. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's, <laughs> between that's, that toes. Yeah, that's that's self love. That's loving yourself. Yeah, looking good when you go out, presenting something that like people want to see, people want to talk to you, people are they're drawn. You know what I mean? Those are all those things are so important. Um, meditating, exercising, eating right, mm-hmm. because all of that has an effect on your mentality, the way you look at things, the way you think about things, and then you start understanding and realizing the meditations. And start realizing that the exercise is a form of meditation. Oh, absolutely. It's the easiest. It's people say, I don't know how to meditate. Just go outside and do some exercise. Go do go do ten thousand steps. Go do your walk. Yeah, go for a walk. Go walk. Seriously. Go, go go to and for me, and for me is I went to I started going to Woodlawn Lake every day. It's right there by my house. So I started going to Woodlawn Lake every day. And I started I started reading and I started audio audio book the um the Rick Rubin book. Yeah. Um, Came okay. out recently. The b- most recent one that he did, and so he started talking about stuff, and I was like, "Oh shit, all of that's related." And he was talking about um, going out into nature. Right? He he. If you haven't read the book, I highly recommend it, especially if you're a creative, if you're an artist, and maybe even if you're not. What's it called? It's called the uh, the art of creation, art of I believe, creation. is what is the name I'll of the book. Yeah, look it up. It's, it, I, I almost it's, bought it's it at Barnes gray. and Nobles. But... It's all gray with a little like square on, it with a little like record looking thing. I believe it's called the art oh, of creation. And so basically, what 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 he starts off in the very the very beginning of the book, he says, "We're all artists. Even if you don't think that you're an artist, you're an artist." And he uses examples. He says, "He says, you take a different route home. You just created something that you hadn't done before. Mm-hmm. So you are now an artist." Right. And then he starts kind of breaking, breaking it all down by that. And then he starts explaining like how going into things with a childlike mentality, right? Like not understanding rules, not understanding Mm -hmm. rules. Right. And so I'm listening to these things, heartbroken, and then relating stuff like being appreciated. And he talks about it first. He said, he's the first thing he says, he says, when you go out, be, pay attention to the, to everything that's breathing and living around you. He says, the trees are living, the grass is alive, the wind is blowing, the insects, the bugs, the dragonflies, the butterflies, all those things are living, breathing things, you know? And then I started to, to, to understand the correlation to God, mm-hmm. right? And so I started, I started doing these walks and these meditations. And then I started going to the, I went to this class, right? I had this friend and um, she had a bookstore. It was called Neotopia Books. And um, her dad was like, a, she came from like a, a, her family, they were all theologists. They were all big theology people, right? Mm-hmm. So her dad was like a theologist and she also studied theology. And so they studied religion and God and it was, it was their, that was, that was their thing. And so she went to school and so she held a little, a little class, you know, a little discussion panel. And she says, I'm going to present this idea, right? And so I was like, well, let's check this out because she kind of presented it as more like a philosophical idea about religion. And I was like, whoa, those two things aren't supposed to like go together, mm-hmm. right? So let's hear what you're talking about. And basically what she described and she, and she said was she says, if we can – she says, I know this sounds crazy. She says, but everybody has this idea and image of God that's untouchable. Right. Like God's in this big thing where like we can't we can't get there. We can't get to him. Right. Because he's so outside of this. He, yeah. He's so big and so more than us. Right. He's not touched. He's not attainable. And she says, 
But if you start to recognize and understand that he's in everything that you do, he's in the way that you live, I started to recognize, oh, you know what? He's right there in those living, breathing plants that I see every day. That butterfly. That butterfly. Yeah. The grass that I'm walking on, you know, like, and then how it connects to me and my body. And so I started to understand and correlate all these things. And I started to say, like, oh, wow, this all makes sense to me. Because up to this point, my 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 religious beliefs were like I was raised Catholic. Uh-huh. My mom put me through private school and I did the sacraments and the, you know the whole the whole thing right like catholic school yeah like mm-hmm. you know up Same. until up until i was like eighth grade or something okay. but up in like but i did like catechism and i did like all the sacraments and like i went through the whole thing you know yeah. but during that whole process like i didn't get it no spiritual no like real spiritual I, connection i didn't understand it yeah, i just was like at. i was like okay there's this God and and then I get older and I start having influences and people and then you start hearing that like no that's actually just a story and you can trace it through all of civilization and every 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 great civilization has a story that's similar to that yeah so sort of creation story, right? it's myth, like yeah the yeah. whole died, how, we, how we got resurrected here. Yeah. you know the whole story right and so I'm thinking like well my mom taught me this right and then I'm thinking too like well. What I can't do is go tell my mom, hey, mom, everything that you thought was BS, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? And so, like, finding that balance, but also being aware of these things and saying to myself, like, I still believe in that, but how can I make this something that I can relate to? Yeah. To where, like, because my mom is like, well, you got to go to church. You know, I had this this discussion with my mom yesterday, actually, and I told her, I said, you know, mom, I said, that's where we're different. And I was like, "I, I don't think that I have to do that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, because I can go outside right now and do it. 100%. You know? And she kind of looked at me and she was like, and it was crazy, right? Because I I got to this point with my mom where like, we both respect each other's like views, right? Outlook. Because cause, because they're not, they're not very different. They're very similar. But when I started going to, and then so, so I'm going back to early in the year when I started exercising and doing all this stuff and then recognizing and going to this class and this, and this girl's telling me like, no, like. It, he's here he's right here mm-hmm. and that was so much more relatable to me because it was something that i could be like okay like this is how i can make that connection right and so it was real powerful for me because it drove a lot of the like hey this is also related to this this is also related to taking care of your body right like loving yourself mm-hmm. you know and then and then that also extends into you can't you can't practice and think all of these things and then get behind get get in your car and go have a road rage incident Right. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, it's truth on both sides. You it's know like, what I mean? Yeah, going to church doesn't like absolve you of everything. You'd like just go to church to check a box. You know, it's just more about how you're right, how you live and how and how and how really engaged and, and how it and how you put that practice into your life, right? And yeah. so I started recognizing and realizing like the whole spiritual thing and God thing, and then I started thinking about like the exercise and like everything all just started coming together, and it all started making sense, and I was like. And I started getting, I started losing more weight. I started feeling more confident. You know, mm-hmm. I go out and people are like, dude, like you're glowing. Like what the fuck? <laughs> you know? And I'm just like, oh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just happy. Just happy. I'm, I'm just happy. Drink a water. Right? Like I'm happy. <laughs> like I'm happy. I, like, like, like I'm putting good stuff in my, I'm eating real food. You know, I'm not consuming six IPAs every night before I go to bed and mm-hmm. consuming a thousand calories. And then wondering why I feel like shit when I wake up in the morning and sleep till noon. Mm-hmm. You know, like dog, wake up at six a.m. Get your day going. Be in bed by eleven o'clock. You know, let's 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 uh let those bags and circles under your eyes go away. You know, that's all part of the self love. And once I started doing that, everything started to open up. That's everything like else, everything this else. Year, you said everything else started to open up. That's yeah. crazy. And so even with like the record shop, right? Like for for a long time, like I I left the record store for. <sighs> couple of years like i did not work like mm-hmm. i did not work at the record shop like at all um i was real burnt out you know all that stuff happened um but what ended up happening is is i started to touch into other passions because like we, like we talk about it right like you you have a passion you love something and you do it like and you get burnt out but like you're still a passionate person like that like that drive and that desire to do things at least for me it just, I just had to find another outlet, 
for mm -hmm. it. You know what I mean? So that same drive and that same desire and passion to be a record guy and to go dig for the records and get in the attic <laughs> and, you know, and, and do all that, like it, 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 it's still there. It's just maybe not records the right. same way. Yeah. You know? At this time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But it means, it doesn't mean that I can't come back to it or it's not there or, yeah. you know, and I think it's just like an evolution. Like you have to evolve as a person, right? Like you can't just like stay in the same place. Right. You know? And so all of the, all of this realizations and understandings that have happened all year have like led me to where I'm at right now. And I feel, I feel better than I have probably ever in my entire life. That's amazing. That's right awesome, now. Man. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, and it's positive. It's good because I'm doing all these things like being positive, thinking positive things, um, recognizing and, and putting, um, what I like to call like triggers, right? Like when something that I know triggers me, and I know I'm going to get upset. Okay. Do something because you know you're getting upset about it. Do something that's going to offset that to where like it's no big deal. You know, like I'll give you a perfect example. One of the things that drives me crazy is when somebody drives the same speed as me when I'm driving down the road. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I feel I, who doesn't, like, that kind of pisses off, off anybody. My space. That kind of pisses off anybody, right? Yeah. So as soon as I recognize it happening, I just let off the gas. I just stop. I just stop. I'm just, just let like, go. I'm just like, cool. <laughs> you must be in a really big hurry, guy. And I'll make a joke, right? And mm -hmm. then it's good. It's over with. Six months ago, maybe a year ago, <sighs> this jerk. Mm -hmm. For what? Dude, that's the biggest barometer for, for my mental health. Uh, is, for what? Is traffic. Really? Is the traffic. Like, for what? Yeah, look at the people on the road. You know, or like, what? You know, another one is like the, and, and I felt so big. And, and it's almost like, Things would happen on purpose. It, it it feels once I started doing all these things, it was like I became more aware of like all the little things that were happening. And I'd be like, damn, dude, this is an opportunity for you to be better about this. Seriously. This yeah. is an opportunity for you right here. And there's your, here's your chance. Right. And I'll never forget it. I remember I was I thought I was doing so great. Right. And then you have moments, right? Like everybody has moments where like things aren't great and I'm, I'm at a red light and I, and I need to get somewhere. And this person is just not making that fucking right turn on that red light. Oh. And I'm just like about to start honking, about to get, start getting gnarly, right? <laughs> and I say, chill out, bro. And I chill out. And guess what? Green light. No, the, oh. the, 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 the car turns. And so I, I pass him. And it's a little bitty old lady mm. who's probably, and I say to myself, she's probably scared to even be on the road right now. Yeah, you might have made her give up her license. <laughs> <laughs> Me behind, honking, yeah. getting on, all grandma. gnarly. <laughs> yeah, and I was just like, and then that happened. I was just like, dude, there you go. Lesson yeah. learned. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. I think it ties into it, like, because that's, that's like a prime example of like something that's like a little thing, like a small interaction in your day. It only took up a couple minutes of your life. And like, yeah. we, we live a lot of minutes. So it's yeah. like, I think it kind of ties into uh, whenever, whenever you were talking, there was a, a clip that blipped in my head from uh, Jordan Peterson. I forget who, who he was quoting. Maybe Nietzsche. I don't know. Some philosopher guy. But he was just saying that it was uh, like some people, most people don't see God because they look, they don't, they don't look low enough. Because they, they kind of put them in that abstract out there, like, oh, we'll never get there. But I think it's as low as, like, where you are right, it's right now. Here. It's, it's right, right here. here. It's right here. It's right, right here. Oh, it's right here. That's what we're looking at. Right? Like, it's right here. It's 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 it's, it's there, you know? Yeah, and I think, the, and the, the breeze that comes through, took, the moments took, of being a little depravity, a little bit of yeah. emotional discipline to be like, okay, let me, let me hold it. Let me, let me slow down a little bit here. It took, it took me my whole life to realize it. Yeah. Like, it took me, like, literally up until this past year to understand and recognize that. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, like, man, how much further would you have been if you had just recognized it? But I also understand the timing, right? Like timing's part things of everything. happen when all in its own time. When they're supposed to, because yeah. that's when you're gonna get the most out of that. You know, it's out wild. of that out of that message. I've known Georgie almost twenty years and we're on a similar resurgence. And I feel like I got a similar lesson in my divorce. I've been divorced six years. And it's like, why do we have to get thrown down on our faces to like take stock mm -hmm. you know what i mean when things are <laughs> when, thing, when things are humming along and doing well i don't I, you know for me it's harder when things are going well it's harder you know when they say let god take the wheel um it's harder for me to to not want to you know just like let things be like but when we get these harsh lessons so when i went through my divorce it was devastating doesn't cover it 
I've got a lot of words. There was no word for for how mm -hmm. how awful that was, right? Mm -hmm. And so I got all these lessons, and I did a lot of similar things. You know, it's no there's no mystery. Sunshine, exercise, sleep discipline, the food you're eating, the relationships that you're choosing to connect with or or distance from. You know, all these things are are baseline, right? And and the psychology of, of your mental health, right? So I was doing all those things and the end game for me was to get my relationship back. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what, boys? That was not the right answer. I didn't do it for me because it was the right thing to do. Oh, yeah. I was doing it to an end to get my relationship back. Well, a couple months ago, I was boohooing about a girl and I was, I was you know, had um, you know, the rug pulled for me at work and devastation, right? Well... I started to do the same stuff, and I'm not some portent of wisdom, right? I'm utter, utterly frail. Dude, share with me what you got your story. Please. Well, the more I get wise, the more I get humbled, right? Mm -hmm. So let's just say that I started to glam on. So, wise man knows nothing at all. Mm -hmm. So I have rigidity in my Catholicism in my upbringing, and had a you know tumultuous upbringing. It was it was it was not a healthy environment from the outside, sure, but on the inside. Not at all. Lived in fear, mm -hmm. um, survival mode, like constantly. So it's it's so wild that Georgie and I are on like a, a similar arc, because my mom warned me against two things when it came to spirituality: against the occult and against meditation. And there's some you know schools of thought about, and, and I don't I don't think you should you know own and exp and put yourself out there because there's there's not there when you talk about energy and frequency and and moving out into the quantum and people yeah. might need to, people <laughs> when, when you start, when you start to get out of the 3D the 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 no body no space no thought and just free yourself in that way you can get in tap into um, all these different frequencies in there mm -hmm. and 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 I've gotten some level of understanding um, I've, I've definitely heard people say to be careful like on well, there's bad like stuff mushrooms out there. or med that, that you could you don't you don't have a remote you don't have a TV guide you go and you channel into something it could be something negative that's correct so I did some some prayer about it because I still have those roots and I still have those beliefs um, and I so I don't have rigidity there, there's something in Catholicism called the the Nicene Creed and one of the lines in it in the prayer is one holy and Catholic Apostolic Church and they're just I, they're just saying this is the only way. And I am not convinced. I feel, you know, and I say that respectfully, yeah. right? And I say that fearfully because I don't pretend to know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't say that with 100% conviction. But if you look at people who have, you know, other beliefs, even into Buddhist spirituality or, um, you know, you, you name it, mm -hmm. uh, Hindu and, and Protestant, Methodist, you know, uh, you name it. Um, I've, I firmly believe that, you know, at, as a as a believer, right mm -hmm. now, now there are some hard and fast things in scripture, and that's my channel, and um, this is this is where I witness, you know, because the more I start to understand in meditation about these energies and frequencies and the gratitude and the joy and the compassion, I start to go back to the word, you know, and so in in Genesis, in the beginning, there was the word, mm -hmm. right, and. And so historically, people would argue, you know, it's a bunch of different random people writing all these, all these verses and, you know, through history. Well, historically, it's supposed to be inspired by God through the Holy Spirit, right? And so you got Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all in one entity. And, and again, major humility here. I, I don't pretend to know, but I have conviction on this one. So I mm -hmm. started to pray on it and I felt that if I... So what's what's Holy Spirit, you know, in in scriptures talking about image and likeness of God. So that's the the energy that is God that is within us. So when you start to talk about aura and when you know someone's real loving and doing the right thing and you just you just feel those wavelengths coming off of somebody, it's just infectious, right? And it's just all pure, unadulterated, honest yeah. love, like unfettered. It's it's its own <laughs> thing. So I've I feel like the Holy Spirit is stronger than any other force. So I would pray for protection to be in that right channel. So um, 
Shout out to Dr. Joe Dispenza. If you want to do a little research on some meditation. Mm-hmm. He's the man. I, I, yeah, did, we're big on I did a week-long retreat in, um, in Nashville. Dude, that's amazing. I've always wanted to go to one of those. And it was pretty wild. And of all the people in there, I felt like I was really guarded, you know, and, and that's not really the necessarily the way to be in the, But to, the, to your point, you know, you can't, just, you can't just open up. Well, I also have this, uh, you know, my, my mom and be careful, you know, and, okay, yeah, and, yeah. and you mm-hmm. know what I mean? So mm-hmm. um, I've had to navigate that and find my way. And so my some my, reservation might be good. Like you shouldn't just do a Ouija board because there's a, a but camp there's people, that throws a Ouija board party. But there's people, <laughs> but there's people who are about that. You know, I don't and think they should be. Uh, I I agree. And this, you know, pe- people think there's you know innocent uh, Satanism. Like you, that, you know, okay. I don't think so, dude. <laughs> <laughs> don't, oh, but that's but I agree with you. There's but, people that are either dumb or didn't. Let's just say uh, to be generous, they didn't have a mom telling them to watch out for that stuff. I'm. We're all on our own, and I feel like I got what I needed to get. So this recent stretch, and it's been about three, four months now, um, I've been incredibly lucky for a time to myself. Mm-hmm. And, um, and for me, it started my spirituality started with surf in Maui. Like, good grief, I was lucky to be able to do this. And on like day three, and I like I was I was in a bad way. At work, I felt like I was the champion of the morale of the house, and it was it was not the way it was supposed to be. <laughs> and everyone's upset. <laughs> <laughs> and it was about vibration and uh, frequency, oh, right? So on on like day three, I, st- I I took a breath out in the water, and oh yeah, here, <sighs> right? And and so we are talking about um, spirituality. I think it does begin with the breath. I. As soon as I started to understand some of these concepts about the quantum, about the past, the present, and the future, you know, if you spend your time looking at the past and what was mm-hmm. me and I'm feeling some kind of way, and some of it's non-specific anxiety. Like I grew up <clears throat> in in that fear, that fear mode, right? And what's wild is, you know, we start getting into the science about how much your brain are we using, you know, like mm-hmm. the intellect versus the subconscious, we're just t- we're just cruising along at five percent, you know. And yeah. I love what you're talking about, Rick Rubin. Is, you know, take like go brush your teeth with the left hand, you know. Get out of bed on the other side of the bed, mm-hmm. you know. Make make a different dish, you know. Go visit somebody you haven't seen. You know those those things where you become the artist and the creative. Because if you live in the predictable past, what do you think you're going to get? What you're creating is mm-hmm. a predictable future, yeah. yep. right? So if it's boo hoo, you're going to get boo hoo, right? And if if you're putting out all this energy. So what's wild, the biggest thing I got out of scripture, out of the word was praying in gratitude as if it's already gone down. Yeah. 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 It's already right? happened. It's already. And that's, it doesn't have to be for somebody who's Catholic. That doesn't have to be mm-hmm. for, right. So when you put out energy, thank you for getting me the right job. Thank you for getting me the right relationship. That's right for me. You know, mm-hmm. and you, and you put it out there with that energy of knowing then you you open to what you're supposed to be, and, and it's about mentality. Yes. So you know a lot of the stuff, a lot of the lessons that I got, um, it's particle versus wave. Have you seen the experiments where the electrons are observed, mm-hmm. right? Like and the, then, the and the then double slit, and somehow they are doing an experiment where they're not observed, which is kind of an oxymoron. It's but, recorded, but they're not mm-hmm. watching it live. Correct. And so what happens to them? They are no longer particle. They go into wave. Yeah, different. Right? Uh-huh. And so when you have a wave like this, see it, touch it, feel it, right? And the more you can get into the, the quantum, which is this, you know, low. So you start thinking about when you're asleep and going from um, alpha and, and beta into gamma and theta waves, mm-hmm. right? And these are people who can just straight meditate and go into, you know, and they're floating off the ground, right? <laughs> right? Um, so... It's it's a fascinating concept, but it makes sense in the most basic way that I can break down is when that particle is a straight line of frequency, when you can fully immerse into the quantum and get out of yourself, right? And no thought, no time, no space, no body, right? And that's hard for me. My brain is busy, man. So what, I, what have I been doing? I've been really nice to myself. Oh, here comes a thought and I'm gentle as a feather. Here comes yeah. a thought and I Bruce Lee... <clears throat> And the more I can stay in there, the more you enter into infinite knowledge and, and can channel in these things. And, and people start talking about manifest, 
you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that these principles are true and I think they can actually coexist with my spirituality in, in the word, mm -hmm. right? 100%. As the mm -hmm. creator. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. The, so we are just infants, just barely scratching at the surface of this science, at, at the surface of the science. Oh, yeah. And, and if, if someone wants to tell you, you know, all science all the time, you know, that, that, that's fine. And it's fine for them, right? But we barely even get it. And I think there's a bit of an awakening going on I like think so. right Justin's now. Justin's been saying that yeah. for like five years. I think that's starting to happen. Something's happening. So I'm starting to recognize what's been pre-programmed sitting in my gut, mm -hmm. right? It, which is this story mm -hmm. where, you know, and I, Georgie knows I like this, this analogy that Dispenza has of the horse, right? So you, 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 you're on this stallion of a horse and the horse wants to chuck you into the wall and it's stomping. And, and so you, you rein back on the bridle, right? I want that Whataburger. So you, mm -hmm. so you, you know, and, and I'm feeling some kind of way. I don't even know why I want, cause you talk about, you know, when you're feeling bad and you start to that decline yeah. for me, you know, yeah. Hagen Dazs, peanut butter, chocolate ice cream, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. smoking too much herb, you know, all that. And mm -hmm. right, so yeah. I can't sleeping in too late. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the avoidance stuff, yeah. poor coping. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that's one vo vice that I've I've mastered as as of right now. I just haven't been smoking. It's like I'm I'm good because I want I want to have that sharpness. That's good, man. I actually took it the other way and I went. Mm -hmm. I did 38 sessions in a hyperbaric chamber to get oxygenated 90 percent to get these neurotransmitters and pathways in the brain. And there's some permanent healing because I was looking for the healing in the in the frontal mm -hmm. lobe from sleep apnea, car crashes, bouncing off a of roof of cars, smoking Oof. all this bud. You know, just negative negative thoughts. Taking waves to the noggin. Yeah, well, the board. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, you know, fo football hits and, and basketball yeah. bonks and stuff like that. It's real. So um, to, to tie it all back in, when you can open up to – and again, I'm, I'm looking for the Holy Spirit to put me in the, in the right channel to get, to get the right information about wholesomeness and, and goodness. And, and Dispenza is talking about love, compassion, joy, gratitude – and having an open heart and a coherent heart and therefore coherent brain energy. And there's a correlative and a back and forth. And it's, it's crazy when you start to study some of the physicality, like I'm not mm -hmm. Captain Yoga, you know, but when you start to look at chakras and the energy centers and the Kundalini, the different breathing. So I, I learned about where you have cerebral spinal fluid mm -hmm. that you can draw up like a, like straw up into your pineal gland and you start looking at the pineal gland through the eyes of Egyptian meditation. And all, you know, there's a reason that people are celebrating. I have Horus stuff. and all that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. man. Th so I guarantee you we've, we've gained and lost all this information several times over. Yeah. Right. Com mm -hmm. com comet, hit, comet hit, wiped us out, Atlantis stuff. Like, I think that's legit, you know? Who, who's you, to say? Younger, younger <laughs> Dryas theory is right. hard to disprove. Dryas. It's hard to disprove if you look at that. That's, that's right. So I'm, different types I'm, of erosion, I'm much more open, erosion. but I also think that aren't, I think we are not meant to fully understand because I think faith is the key. Man, I heard this guy talking last night on a podcast about the the coolest thing in the world is like the mysteries that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't have the mysteries that What's we don't point? understand. What's the purpose? It actually might not just be boring, but that might be close to like enlightenment. Like we would eat the apple of good and evil so that we could know everything. But if you knew everything... We think of it as like a sin because why? Because you would know corrupt information or we would hurt people. But maybe just knowing everything takes away from the magic of what God made for us. And that is just a sin. It's just mm -hmm. like ugh, who would want to take away from God's work? You know what I'm saying? Sure. So I don't think we can really – I don't think we'll ever know these things. Like that Library of Alexandria needed to burn to preserve God's mystery. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. At least that that's kind of this whiff I caught last night that like, oh, I don't think we'll ever find out about aliens, actually. We'll never know <laughs> if there's really aliens, because if we knew, then like in this guy's eyes, we would be closer to full enlightenment, which like isn't what we're here to do, actually. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. It's it's a thought experiment. I'm not saying I'm married to those beliefs, but I I think we'll we will actually get some of that knowledge. And I think we'll also start to understand things beyond this 3D plane, mm -hmm. right? Where our capacity for thought is into 4D and 5D, pass into the quantum. And I think, you know, God is love, God is light. That's where we're talking about particle, this corporeal body versus wave in the spirit where people exist. I don't think we even barely, we're not even 
remotely scratched on the surface. Of, like we, we're not tapped into what we're we're capable of, mm -hmm. you know. And, and so again, wildly humble in in just this bit. That, you know, I'm I'm reluctant to say the term wisdom, you know, but this stuff about, um, you know, the the past, present, and future all being on one line instead of wave. If you're if you're in energy alone, then you can open up like Georgie's been into all these new possibilities, you know. Mm. Um, and it, if you can if you can open up to that, all the possibilities are available to you. So that's where that manifestation comes into. Like, what do you really want? Mm -hmm. You know. So what 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 does it look like to you? And What's get your a dream? get a yeah get yeah, a real right? get a real picture. I want a record store. You know, like. You know, for me, I want to open up a restaurant and I can picture Sylvester's tasting room and I've got some business plans and I've been lucky enough to have this, this thing. And so I, I, I fully firmly believe this is not a maybe and I'll, and I'll get to it. And I actually think I'm, I'm on the cusp sooner than later nice. that this stuff is, is coming to me. And the more I relinquish control, right. And give it up to God and pray and then pray. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for bringing this to me. You yes. know, and not knowing, because I don't pretend to need to know. In fact, the magic's in that's the where unknown. the magic is. The magic's mm -hmm. in the unknown. That's where the faith is. I yeah. Don't pretend you to can't have to faith without hard. the unknown. You can't. Eat, that's 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 the requirement for the faith. Yeah. The unknown. You can yeah. hop yeah. into it. But yeah, I think I, lo or I love what you said because there's a. I remember talking to one of our coworkers a long, long time ago when we worked on the rubber walk, but I remember coming to like the a thought of about. It's like whenever someone gives you a gift, like what what's what's your first reaction? It's gonna be thank you. Like no matter totally. what. Every time, no matter what. So if you just like maintain that thank you mentality, just outlook on your life, no matter what is going on, it's like thank you. It's like that. That'll be like a, kind of projecting that manifestation forward of I'm gonna be I'm gonna be given reasons to be thankful. If I'm like truly holding that energy right now, then it'll already happen. I'll be given sure. things to be thankful for, even in the unknowing or even in like a a bad situation. If you're still able to be like Jocko or fucking David Goggins, be like good. Fuck yeah. That thing fell through? Okay, good. Fuck it. It's, it's a blessing because of this and this I and love, this. And just fucking I push that. through it. Oh, there's a 20 top coming in at 9 o'clock. Can I have them, please? Yeah. Like, please, I want, like, I look, I've been working all night for this. You know what I'm saying? Just like mm. flipping it on its head like that. Yeah. If there's one thing I could boil down about how there's been a resurgence and, you know, for everybody listening, is you have your, everyone's got their past, right? And everyone's got a different dose of different things and things they've been dealt right and i feel like these are very purposeful things there's a reason everybody's got a spectrum of gifts and talents and lessons that they've gone through so to really boil down to one thing is you can look at it and people talk about victim mentality and what the you know what the young kids are in the culture and you know uh you know you know don't don't mm -hmm. touch me uh, I'm, <laughs> you know like it, and it's wild to me to see some of that so you know i've got some gray in my beard now so that there is a little bit of wisdom well it wasn't until recently that I started to look at my mom and dad differently hmm. and thank you for the lesson. I started looking at the the difficulties, like thank you for the lesson in my divorce. Like that, the, when I was in the thick of it, in the throes of it, you know, I worked for like 11 months to try to reconcile, you know, and was, mm -hmm. was bearing, I was looking for re opportunities to reach out and what have you. And I'm so glad that it didn't come back to me now, you know, for, for a multitude of reasons, right? Um, but how do I view it? And I can tell you the most demonstrative shift in that I know that there's been some movement is after six years and I was just texting with the ex only is that I've reached out and we've hugged it out and cried and, and, you know, and it's not perfect. You know, I, I'm still in my feels. I've got anger, resentment, pain, embarrassment, like the whole thing. Right? Oh, you're human. Mm -hmm. Right. But I have been able to get over that and I'm breathing because I'm looking at it differently with thanks and gratitude for the lessons. So you can choose to be the victim or you can choose mm -hmm. to say thank you because that's what I was supposed to get. And that right there, no matter who you are or what it is, is is how to how to boil that down. Now mm -hmm. I do have a you know a, a bigger thing and an homage. Shout out to God and Jesus and, uh, and hold it down, bro. Big man upstairs. <laughs> this is my dog <laughs> because that's my that's my channel. And you know, if anybody's even remotely you know thinking, I think it's my calling to to represent not by blah blah blah, but like how I'm living it. And and that's you know, you're talking about traffic. When I'm feeling some kind of way, 
and I'm getting angry behind the wheel. I already know I'm off base. And I, and I got my kids looking at me. Yeah, I got yeah, my yeah. kids next mm-hmm. to me, you know? And I would never badmouth their mother. But man, was I putting out some waves. I was putting out some some energy of, of anger and pain and resentment. You know, I couldn't sit next to her at the basketball game, you mm-hmm. know? So now I'm, I'm, again, not perfect with it, but that's been a huge shift about how am I viewing all this stuff. And, and that's, it's been wild. And I, I brought up Dispenza to George. He's like, was like, like, say what, you know, like I really, I know I surprised him and the trajectory that we're both on. It's so wild knowing you for almost 20 years that, um, and you're right. It's, it's almost natural to be like, man, if I only had this, like in my twenties, mm-hmm. you know, like I had some, some failures. It's, it's, it's stayed with me. I didn't finish my degree at school I, uh, at university of Maryland. I, I was like, uh, I had I had wrestling four years in high school, so in the structure of going to high school, and then that winter was the first winter I didn't have structured workout, mm-hmm. you know, and so I I did well, pleasure fraternity got got B's and you know did finally like a three point and then the second semester was some winter doldrums, drinking every night, start smoking bud, was eating late at the dining hall. I was like sleeping sixteen hours. Jeez. And and sold my books back for beer because I was not happy and settled and was not Damn. looking at myself. I was I was all avoidance all Dude, the time. Dude, I pledged to that fraternity too. Oh, hey. my, my story was so similar. Hey. I I got prescribed coding because I was sick and I was having like terrible coughing that was waking me up in the night. Later it was um they said it was uh uh maybe meningitis I think maybe oh man because yeah. my spleen well, ended up infection. rupturing yeah. yeah so they thought it was maybe flu maybe cold and I'm going just going to Texas State Health Center whatever I'm just to tie it up quickly they give me some codeine the second semester of my freshman year I did all right my first year my first semester I'm um, taking codeine at night helping me sleep mm-hmm. I, I just can't wake up for this 8 a.m. fucking it's like business school but it's like mine was physics of light damn. <laughs> What's the ex- how ironic <laughs> physics of work? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's the Excel class where they teach you how to do all of the Excel and Word stuff? But it's a it's a business school class. But it's called like CIM or CI like CIS. C- maybe it's CIS. Mm-hmm. Computer science something. CSI. Yeah, maybe something like that. The business school computer science class. And I just couldn't fucking go. Mm-hmm. And then after eight weeks, I show up to a class. They're fucking doing mm-hmm. stuff. You know, they're yeah. like, all right, go off to like I don't even know what I'm doing. I sat there, felt like an idiot, and then proceeded to tank, dude. Just like yeah. Not and, and a lot of it was about not looking at myself in the moment. That's what's led to a lot. Not saying like, "Hold on, what's happening here?" Just mm-hmm. like this weird like slip into this gray area where I just like just tanked it. And then I look back. I was thinking this morning actually when I was trying to wake up at six thirty in the morning, and I'm like, "What the fuck is wrong with you? Why can't you just wake up when you want to wake up?" You know what I'm saying? Then I'm like, you know, maybe don't talk to myself like, "What the fuck is wrong with you?" But I'm like, mm-hmm. "What is that?" You know, like Grace. So. One of my struggles with, especially with my spirituality, is like this all or nothing perfection, mm. and and it, and and we're we're not. It's not possible. So, does that mean premeditated failure? No, dude, no. But as soon as you have a shortcoming, you you acknowledge it. You you sit with it for a second, and then you and then you pick your head up. You know. Mm. Yeah. So, so a lot of this undoing that I've had was this story that I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I was always under duress. You know. And and it's perpetuated in my gut. There's a there's this re, rewritten story that's it's an invisible bull ring in my nose, you know, like running me around. And so the wildest thing is like I'm feeling some kind of way, and it's 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 not a bill, it's not a test, it's not some pressure or whatever. It's non-specific anxiety of, of, and feeling some kind of way about from the past, perpetuating living. Now, so as soon as I started to have some shifts about how I saw the past, I got more energy released. Mm-hmm, and that's mm-hmm. and that's where there's some spirituality, you know, kumbaya, yogi, yogi kind of stuff, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's real. Yeah. Jordan Pearson talks about that for sure as well. I, I, I'm, I'm, I quote him all the time. That's mm-hmm. one of my dogs. He's just like in my Rolodex of mental thoughts. But he was talking about like if you have an event or if like if, 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 within your past, in the, in the story of your past – if you're not able or if there are parts of it that whenever you do like reevaluate or like try to remember what happened and it's like if you're reading reading the story of your past and there's portions or paragraphs or entire chapters that you can't read without like cringing at or without like some sort of emotional response mm-hmm. it's like part of you is trapped there like part of your energy is like still over there like you're not projecting your energy forward and upward and onward like part of you like you're only processing it 
seventy percent of like your no question creative ability, like your like your artistry, like that Ruben was talking about. Like we're all creatives and artists, so like we're creating our life, and like life mm-hmm. is our canvas. So it's like you don't, you don't have all your tools there if you're like leaving some of your energy in the past. You know what I'm saying? There's a concept called mm-hmm. internal family systems, mm-hmm. which is focused on the inner child. And stuff I started to learn is about you know. So I've got scared to death little John, and I and I'm pretty sure he's about five years old. You know, scared to be abandoned. And all this. And I've got an older one who's scared also. And then I've got angry John. I've started to get, started to get, you know, a l- maybe a little bit stronger. Want to fight stepdad, mm-hmm. you know, like, and and then I've got, you know, the, these layers. But they, the these inner child, uh, these inner children don't know. I'm a 50 year old man, and I've got you, like, you know, like I, yeah. I've I've mm-hmm. got them. So there there's some. Discussions where you know they don't know about each other's existence, and and some people might think, oh, this is a little loosey goosey. But no, they're you know in the psychology yeah. about addressing and having conversations, and part of that, and some of the stuff is through meditation and to open up stuff. So that's why people go you know and get this you know hypnosis and unlock stuff that's been repressed. Mm. Um, I mean, I f- I feel for somebody who, um, and again, I say this wildly humbly. I'm just barely starting to get going on this stuff, you know, but if, if, and and because my coping was avoidance in so many different forms, you know, and I don't want to name them also. (laughs) Mm. We all got them. I don't want to, to, but take stock with yourself. When you feel in some kind of way, that's, that's my, my two cents. If anybody's going to get a takeaway is to be kind with yourself about the shortcomings because it's all good. We're all coming up short, you know? Still, though, this morning, I'm telling you, I'm trying to get up at 6.30, mm-hmm. and I started thinking about, man, you failed out of college, you know what I'm saying? You, you, didn't, you didn't even make it to college to be an athlete like you wanted to. That's on repeat. It's, mm-hmm. it, I didn't realize it was until, like, this morning. That, that's what Then later on, I was like, why was that even on my conscience? Like, why was I, like, evaluating that? You know yeah, what I'm saying? That was, like, 10 years ago. Yeah, but I was just like... Justin has no problem getting up to be at this workout, you know? And in fact, he finished school just fine too. But you can't get out of bed and you couldn't finish school. Like what's what's wrong with you that you can't compete at that level? Right. But it just wasn't even true. Like to be honest with you, like no offense or anything, but I, I showed up to the gym before Justin today. Mm-hmm. Just not, it's not to say that I'm better than him at all, but just like the story I was telling myself of like he's already beating me there because I'm not shit because blah 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 blah. But then in post, when I just look at what happened, I got up at a decent time. I got out the door at a decent time. I showed up at a decent time, and I should be just like happy and thankful for that. You know what I'm saying? Dude, to say mm-hmm. that it's not even true. How how cool is that? Right? I'm not yeah. worthy. Bullshit. Right, exactly. we all are. Yeah, like right, it's like just... th- that f- that feeling. You're not good enough, and whatever you, whatever avenue, vein, and if it's just relationships or career or your aspirations and, yeah. and your your artistry and all that, whatever you know? you're trying to do. No, yeah. we are we are all the artists. We are all the creators. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Yeah, it's cool. It's it's a nice reminder because we just get – even myself, you know, I do this podcast. I talk to people about gratitude and like even on my own self, this is like my whole life is kind of about trying to find these people like Rick Rubin or Jordan Peterson so I can try to like, I don't know, heal myself or something, be the best version of myself I can mm-hmm. be. But like even for me, I, I just get jammed up. You know what I'm saying? I think anybody can just get jammed up and life's just a lot. It's so much. Yeah. It's hard to cover all your bases and know all the ways that you're limiting yourself and all the ways you can release yourself and unlock yourself where the energy is hidden in your past that you haven't let go. It's a difficult thing to manage. Well, all I love this. and respect the version yeah. of all three of you guys that I get. Love you guys. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, love you, man, bro. bro. Hell yeah. yeah I think love you're you, the man. first person to come on the podcast yes. and witness. <laughs> that was hard. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, that's part of my, I think, part of my, Thank you. part of my calling, maybe not necessarily to, to lead. I'm not trying to make anybody off put, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't think but, so. But no. staying, staying true. Me and Justin are singing and, praises all the time. On, I also, on the show. you know, struggle. Yeah, just struggle. Yeah, we're all there's, just living our there's, living there's our story. Liquid IV gentleman Victor, he actually did have a lot of testimonial like things to say too. Yeah, he was. He was, cool. he was popping off. Once you get moved, you get moved. You know what I'm saying? You want to talk about it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I don't think there's because like yeah, what Joe Dispenza is talking about. Because I love that guy. I love like everything he's about and his practices and his books and all that. And I would love to go to a week long week long retreat. That'd be badass. But I think that there's like a, maybe a thought that. You could like they're kind of mutually exclusive, or like what he's talking about is not like religion per se. But I think there's like a, I don't know. I'm like right in the overlap, like Full spirituality. spirituality. You know what I'm saying? It's like a, yes, I didn't really and like going to church is because I mean, you were talking about your mom going to church, and like I guess you you also mentioned that your your mom, older generation, they're more they're more like watch out for that, watch out for that 
Ouija BG stuff. I mean, a, a, like a, a rigidity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And 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 somebody had mentioned. I think you're talking about if you're not practicing. So, so what if you go to church and you're cussing somebody in the parking lot trying to get out? Like, right. Like, give me exactly. a break. Exactly. And, and we mm-hmm. and, and I'm not trying to judge. In fact, the that's actually one of the biggest take, takeaways from religion. And, and it's kind of wild. You start reading some of the Old Testament and rain, fire, and brimstone down on their heads, and you know. Uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. Psalms. It's stuff. some crazy yeah. stories, bro. So, so David is. <laughs> People be is dying. Praying, shit. If, if you're gonna start in the, you know, Psalms is pretty, pretty, pretty wild. And there's a long one in 169 that's that's heavy, but like that's you know Jesus turned the other cheek. You're not trying to wish any pain on anybody, right? But we also have some base human elements. As someone, you're a bully, you're an attacker, you're an oppressor, right? Like mm-hmm. how how often have you been turning around and like pray for that person like you know I I don't mm-hmm. wish anything on them and wish them well you know and and, and principle is you're really doing that for yourself mm-hmm. you know yeah like that's that's our best selves is to want good for everyone you know can you imagine if everybody had that same mentality you know across the globe you know we'd have we would just there would be sharecropping and and people everybody be focused on. Uh, you know, and I'll, maybe maybe not necessarily communism, but like, yeah. uh, but like everybody be free to everybody to be good. Their, is to, everyone at least good? Like, right? Is everyone good. at least baseline you chilling? You good? Like, mm-hmm. If all yeah. our world that you're yeah. a high dose of mushrooms. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I was, what I was getting to because I was going to say it's like I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think that's because because uh, I never really I never really went to church growing up. Maybe for like Christmas Eve and Easter, mm-hmm. maybe, mm-hmm. and that was pretty much it. But then after I had we'd experienced and s- dabbled into like the the mega multivitamin psychedelic realm and going to like peeling back the curtains of like what's going on here. And like, mm. sort of like whenever you're in that place, like your ego's kind of stripped away. Yeah. And like from that place, I've, I've like felt, the, I felt the spirituality, the high, high you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, it wasn't like a question. It wasn't just like, Oh my God, like this, this shit's, this is all crazy. Yeah. You know, all this, this 3d thing is just like a 3d thing. And we're all being generated into this thing from something else. I don't know. There's, there's something else going on here. It's pretty much like the ultimate takeaway that pretty much is universally been found. And like those, all those like mescaline, ayahuasca, all those types of things, like LSD, mushrooms, all that stuff is like, everyone's pointing towards that same thing. Mm -hmm. But I think that, so I think that having that, I was able to enter into that spirituality and everything sort of got kind of like shifted. Like my my taste in music, it was definitely like hip hop driven, like Big Sean, Drake, J. Cole and Kendrick. And then like a lot of their music started to hit a lot differently after that Mm. period. I was able to like kind of hear what they were saying about sort of the abstract nature of things and the creative nature and the interactive nature of life. And you're able to manifest things with your own mentalities and that kind of stuff. Shout out to RZA. Right. It's like, I think all of that. And like, so it's it's crazy. I'm able to like see Joe Dispenza and like see Big Sean and like merge the two. And like in my own mind, it all makes sense. And everything's like, oh, this is what's going on here. There's not, there's not even a question in my mind when you're like in that other space and you're like, oh shit. There's no like, oh, what if? There's no doubt. There's no like, the dialogue becomes more of a monologue and the monologue becomes like a, you're just like getting fed information instead of like having a debate whether it's true or not or whether you're being biased or unbiased or whatever's, whatever's going on. But I think it's just a crazy, awesome thing that, yeah, Joe Dispenza is really about and just getting into that abstract realm will bring you to like a place where you're just like a spiritually, like you're, you're chill, like you're good. You don't need to go to church necessarily. But I think that, cause I guess the way that I kind of phrase it is like church didn't bring me to like God. Or it's like God brought me to the church. Like I came into contact with God directly. Like God's bigger than a book. He's bigger right. than a church. He's bigger than a building. Sure. He's bigger than mm-hmm. a mm-hmm. belief system. He's mm-hmm. bigger than belief systems. You know that you know what I'm saying? That brings <laughs> bars, yo. <laughs> you know, a lot of people Do you want off? are yeah, seriously. <laughs> a lot of people get turned off because men are fallible, right? So you got, you know, all these gilded churches and people are poor and suffering. And and how does that jive? You know, and mm. so I'll, sh- I'll share. So I just recently went to get my annulment paperwork going so that the church would recognize my divorce. So I wouldn't be bound by that. And my ex did all, all the sacraments except for, for her confirmation. She refused it. And she wrote a letter that was so eloquent that they actually published it, you know, Whoa. and she like got respect because she's highly intelligent, you know, mm. shout out, shout out to my ex. Shout out. So, <laughs> so, um, I didn't remember this at the time. So I call up the church and the lady's like, you know, what was the date? And, and John Sylvester, okay, cool. John Michael, I'm like, yeah. She says, you weren't baptized. Like all angry gatekeeper style. And I was so floored. I was not ready for that. And and I had, had some feelings on it, you know. 
Like I was like, I just like stammered to her. Like I've got a picture of myself on my grandmother's lap and my grandfather's baptismal gown and I've received all the sacrament. Like and I'm think, and later on I'm like, I wanted to cuss and be like, you know, bitch. I'm like, <laughs> fuck you I, mean. I, I was just married through your church. What are you talking I'm about? Fucking right? baptized bitch. We talking about. <laughs> so obviously that's a challenge <laughs> for me to, I'm given this very specific challenge. So I end up, and then I remember my mom couldn't find my baptismal certificate. Right. So I started this, this hunt and it turned out to be wild. Like I found in my yeah. scrapbook, the first Eucharist and it was like Elizabeth Ann Seton and Crawford and Maryland. So I called them up and the lady couldn't be nicer. And she had to go back before the computer files and started digging in the dusty yeah, file. The story's crazy. <laughs> and, and so it was my, usually they're attached, but it wasn't, it was just my Eucharist. So she was super nice and had some nice teas. And so I call uh, my mom had an association um, who, who lost her husband with um, – so I, I called up Fort Meade because I remember going to the PX there. I was like, maybe the chaplain baptized me or something. They didn't even call me back. So I was like, you know, what am I doing here? So I called up the Archdiocese of, of Baltimore. And this is after calling, you know, Archdiocese of San Antonio and can't get anybody to call me back. They're real busy, I guess. Right. This is what, this is, here's me judging. You know? it's, you're okay, you're okay. It's funny. Okay, okay. It's funny. Hey, I, I did it. I'm, I, I'm good now. So – um, I, I had this lady who, um, normally answers the phone was on the lunch break. So the lady, the woman in charge of records, Janet was unbelievably cool. And it was the person in charge of records. And she was like, oh, I got you. And she calls me back the next day. Oh yeah, we got you. Um, there's a record at, uh, St. Anthony's in, in Falls Church, Virginia. I didn't even know about this parish, you know, hmm. like, I was a peanut, you know, who's going to remember. Yeah, yeah. So, um, weeks and weeks go by and while I'm. At the Joe Dispenza retreat, I get a phone call from St. Anthony. Hey, this is so-and-so. We got your record. You want to come pick it up? I'm like, well, I'm in Texas. You can't get to Virginia right quick and you mail it to me, right? But it was one of those coincidental things moments. because I was I was all super open. You're all and serendipitous I, and open and shit. I was. I was. <laughs> my heart was pulling. And because it was weighing on me, right? You know, and I want to be free of this. Like yeah. my, my ex who was a lapsed Catholic and I, I was supposed to be the champion of that and i was horrible we, we, got, we went to church on christmas and, and, it, and mm. i did not do i did not toe the line right so i you know openly admitting all that and that was a big reason i think for the for the failure right but i'm like you know my my ex who wasn't catholic you know divorced me and I, should i be bound by this you know what i mean and i felt like no heck no oh, i should not yeah. you know so uh, i get back and when i get back from the retreat i'm expecting Phone ringing off the hook with job offers, you know, like all, all the shifts and, and relationships and, uh -huh. you know, like, and, and I didn't get the knocks on the door like I, th I thought. And I'd done a lot of work before going. So I think I'd already started to kind of engender mm -hmm. some of, some mm -hmm. of these synergies beforehand. Mm -hmm. So I had some, you know, some discussions and job offers and stuff like that. Um, but you want to know when the date is, when you're starting. And so I was trying to be comfortable with not knowing, right? So... A couple weeks go by, and so I call back to Falls Church, uh, St. Anthony's, and the lady's like, oh, it got mailed back to us. Like, I don't know how. So I confirmed oh. the address, and so she mailed it back out, and I got it. So now I'm just waiting for one notary signature, and I'll be able to submit all this stuff, you know. Yeah. But part of the exercise was, you know, you got to jump 50 hoops and answer a million questions mm -hmm. and pay your money to, to Catholicism. On some yeah. random – some random – Well, what – Events. <laughs> what – what came out of that was also answering some of the questions about the nature of a relationship. X didn't take my last name, who I told her at the time. You know, I'm a man. Like, I want you to take my name. Yeah. I, but I love you. That's not the deal breaker. Okay. And she had a long-term relationship of, you know, this boyfriend for six years. She's like, I want to stay friends with this guy, you know. And I'm like, well, I don't like it, but I love you. Go ahead, you know. And so, like, all these concessions I was making kind of came back up. Oh, you know, again, with I was made to feel less than. So I was accepting less than, you know, mm. and and so you can, you know, people can argue on either sides, but, but I felt some kind of way. So I want my partner to understand that and maybe squash that or minimize that mm. or, or express something in a different kind of way. I know I just went tangent on that, but, <laughs> but <laughs> it's so relatable, but you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so don't expect, don't accept, you know, less than you're worth. You have to have your healthy boundaries and uh, don't compromise yourself. Love yourself first, and then 
that's the pool that everything else swims in, you know? Yeah. And so it comes back to how you're taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I, f I feel like that was, uh, that was what I was called to share today. That was it, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was awesome. I'm talking about self-love. It's tight. Oh, it's tight. It's that was tight. cool. That was a mm -hmm. weird direction. Not a weird direction. That's kind of what we're about. But <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I went that direction. That's it the main cool. idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got some stories out of it. So what's going on, I guess, is uh, the next foreseeable future for the, the record store. What's, what's happening? Uh, Well, <laughs> we have to move. Okay. So we got to move. Uh, I'm thinking that we'll be uh, – we have to be out of the space by the 1st of January. Um, so I'm not going to have much of a holiday season this year. Um, got you, got which, you. It kind of sucks. Um, yeah, sucks. So we're looking at we're looking at we're looking at making some moves. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 about really all I can really say right now. Yeah, about that's all the good. Story. You that's know, it's like we're 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 looking to make a move. Um, staying in the city. Yeah, we're staying in San Antonio. We're staying in San Antonio. Uh, hopefully, staying in the same neighborhood. Okay, we would like to stay in the same neighborhood. Um, I'm just kind of upset. Yeah. Yeah, man. I'm just upset. You know, um gentrification. Yeah, man. I, I, I watched it right in front of my face. Really? It happened. Just right literally right in front of my eyes, man. You know, the city came in, they put a lot of money into redoing the the streets and doing the infrastructure of like that part of the neighborhood. Um, they did a horrible job. Oh it. shit. Like they made a four lane street, a two lane street. Oh. That sounds oh, backwards. That sounds silly. <laughs> yeah. So but it's it really was, nice. It was a four. It was huge, a four, it was, huge yeah. street. Paved straight. Yeah, Freshly paved. So like the traffic's crazy. And then once they did that, um, taxes went up. Mm. You know, uh, the building went for sale. You know, another outside investors, you know, that have deep pockets bought it. And slowly it was like, hey, your rent's going to go up. Hey, you're, we need you to pay more. Fuck. Hey, uh, we're going to do all these improvements in the building, but uh, eh, I think you're going to have to pay for it. You know what I mean? Really? What the yeah. hell? As far as like increasing your rent? And rent and stuff? just like little sneaky things. Charges. Like, like, you know. Oh, yeah. I put it this way. When we signed the lease with our original landlord who like lived right down the road, like was part of the community. He was an artist in San Antonio. Like is gente. What I like to call gente. You know, mm. he's, he's people. People. You know? yeah. He's like me. Uh you know, it was like a, I think our lease agreement was, you know, that big. <laughs> Tell me why this next it was lease a tweet. agreement was like this. Ugh. You know, it's just like, okay, I got a well, lawyer. What's, what's all, what, what is all this lawyer, in yeah. here? You know, so there was a lot of like gray areas is like stuff that happens to the building. It's like, well, who's responsible? Oh, well, what the con what does the contract say? Or what does the lease say? Oh, the lease is really not. I had to hire Say a team. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, so that kind of that's going on. Um, yeah, that sucks. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't really know like what it's kind of sad. Like, I don't really know like what the future really holds. hundred percent, hundred percent for the store right now. As far I mean, we we have a second location. We have a second store in Eureka, California. That's okay. right. Um, and we've had this one here for a while now. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really know what's going to happen. But no um, matter where you land, you got friends of sound label and you'll be out there not just letting people buy stuff. You want to engage people and create yeah, experiences. So, so we'll see what happens, man. Um, it's it's kind of up in the air. So yeah. I, don't, I don't really know. Uh, I'm I'm sure everything everything is going to work itself out. Um, That's it. We've it got always some, does. <laughs> yeah, we've got some we've got some plans and some things that we're working on. Uh we've got a, we've got some pretty big plans and we're just kind of hoping that it all Comes together. Yeah, the timing, right? Exactly. You know, the the, the, the space. Um, luckily, you know, the the community has been really good. Um, the community has been great. Um, we've had a lot of, like, help from um, people getting the story out. Um, we did a we did some news stories and some coverage. And I've had people in the community reach out and be like, hey, you know, like, my buddy owns this place or this place is for rent or this space is available. So that's been good. That's mm -hmm. been positive. So there's been a lot of that. So. Yeah, so something will come up. I think it always yeah. it always kind of that's part of what we're a lot talking to or talking about alluding to throughout our conversation today. We're talking like a, the, the the timing of things and like the just the way that things play out because mm -hmm. like whenever you're in the story, you're in the story, and like you don't like when you're watching a movie, like you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. But then like after you finish, like the you know you know how it's gonna or it's gonna work out, it's gonna play out fine. But you just don't know exactly the details. And I think yeah, we talked about like that's where the magic is, the not knowing. Yeah, yeah, that's, that was, that's, that's part, where the faith that's is part at. Of the conversation that we we're having earlier. Yeah, that's kind of where it's at. Um, so yeah, 
That's that's uh Dude, that's tight. What's like the the record? So how, how's that how's that market? Like are there like, as far as like your, your competitors are there a couple other stores um, in the area? There's a lot of stores in the area. Um it's actually funny you asked that because one of the things that you know we were talking about like being a purist, right? And kind of going back yeah. to that whole thing earlier. Different styles. Yeah, you know, um that's kind of something that's beginning that we're beginning to see in the store. Um what I mean by that is that um we're like purists. You know, we're like old heads. I like I like old records. I like old jazz records. I like old blues records. I mm-hmm. like, you know, soul 45s, disco, reggae, funk, boogie, you know, cumbias, ballads, you know, Hell yeah. rare groove, um, library records, you know, uh, minimal wave, you know, dance music, you know, progressive house music. Like, I love all of it, man. Like, yeah. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm all over. And so uh-huh. my store, we try to keep that purist mentality. Okay. But but what's happening now is like records are popular. So you can go buy a record at Walmart right now. You really? can go buy a record at When did that Target. start happening again? Because uh, I guess I'm sure they had them and then I'm sure they took recently, them away. Recently. It hasn't been and then so, they, they brought them back. It hasn't been so recently. But like right. re- records have become such a popular thing that like you can go buy your records at Walmart. Right? That's crazy. You can go buy them at, That's crazy. You know, when you're shopping at Target, right? Yeah, and so, yeah. And so what it does though is that like it – it creates competition for me, one, yeah. right? Um, but you now have the popular chain places selling the thing that was supposed to be niche. And so that's, Underground, so, yeah. yeah, so that's where the divide comes, right? Because like, I don't, I got into selling records because I like, I like, I like the records that I like. Yeah. You know, I like to connect to the people that get and understand what I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm having to maybe sell records to people who don't really get it. Mm-hmm. They might they they might buy this record and they don't even have a record player. Yeah, <laughs> just like to have it as decoration. They just want they just want it because it's cool. Yeah, right? because it's a fact. Or to collect it. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And so it's just like or like they don't want the standard black variant. They want the one that's red with sparkly glitter and purple something, and the covers. So it's just like so, like okay, so what are you? That's buying? like non-traditional. So it's just like yeah. So it's like so, are you buying the record for the music, or are you buying it for what it looks like? Yeah, the aesthetic. Like, I'm I'm about what it sounds like. Yeah, I see, I feel you, you know what I mean. And so now there's like a consumer that is chasing that thing, the popularity, like the fad part of it, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, or and so my store doesn't care. I don't carry a whole lot of new records. You know what I mean? Like you want like some Sam Cooke records. You know, you want some Miles Davis LPs. You want some John Coltrane. You want some of that stuff like, yeah, I got those records. I don't have like the Tyler, the creator records. Or, yeah, yeah. Not to, say, not to take anything away from it, but like those are just not, not records that I usually sell at my store. So yeah. now there's this difference of like, okay, well, there's money in that though. I was going to say, so yeah, you might be going to on the market. Or, so how uh, do you find that market, right? And it also mm-hmm. kind of goes to that whole purist mentality of things, mm-hmm. right? Like. I got into, I, I, got, I opened up a record store because I love music. Not because I want to sell records. Yeah, I see what you're saying. You, you, you know what you I mean? You appreciate the art of it. Yeah, so like, but now I'm kind of getting pushed to the point where like, hey, you know what, like rent, you got payroll, you got you got taxes, you got mm-hmm. income taxes, you got state taxes, you got property taxes, you got, oh, you, you, you want to write a check to your employees? Oh, you got to pay a tax for that too. You know what I mean? Like all, all, all of that stuff. So there's a lot of overhead in running a legitimate business. Of course, yeah. You know, and so now it's just like, okay, well, like, can you sell five of those Harry Styles records? Like, uh, I'd rather sell one John Coltrane record. Mm-hmm. You, mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, you're starting to get into the, the yeah, the yeah the balance and the yeah. teetering of the so, sales so, so, profit. So, so that's kind of where I'm at, you know, but, like, ultimately, like, what I have to remind myself, and this is the positive thing that I take away from it, is that um, what I have, when people come into my store, I want them... Regardless of whether they're looking for one of these records that we talked about, like a new edition or like, not, I mean, not a new edition, but like like a newer record that just yeah, came out. recently. That you can go get at Walmart, right? Like, yeah. essentially, the consumer and the customer, and I, and I hate to say this, right? I don't want to say like, I don't want a certain customer in my store, but it's like, I want the purest, right? Like, that's, because that's who I am, right? Like, that's, that's your target that's, audience. That's me, that's yeah. me, right? And so, what I'm having to recognize and understand is that like, I may not get that person in my store, right? And somebody may come into my store and they're like, oh, you don't have the 
Dua Lipa record or you don't mm. have the Sabrina Carpenter. New, right, exactly, right? And I'm going to be like, no, I don't. And I can't because it goes back to what, we, what we've been talking this whole time, right? Is like I can't have that mentality if I'm better than you, right? Or I get this more than you. Mm-hmm. And and right now in this in this specific instant that we're talking about, it's really hard, right? Because I'm looking at people that buy their records at Walmart and want this new commercial music and that's on the radio. And yeah. I'm I've never been that's never been me, right? Like <laughs> so it's hard. But what I've the balance, right? Like so we talked about setting balances and setting triggers and setting things to kind of like check yourself, right? Mm. And so the thing that I've done to check myself in this very specific situation is say, you know what? I may not have the record that this person wants, and that's okay. I don't have to try to bully them or be snobby to them. I can just be cool. I can just be chill. I can just create more of an experience. Mm -hmm. And you're going to leave here without getting the record that you want, but you're not going to be upset. Yeah, different value. You're not going to be like, oh, that sucked. You're going to be like, oh, man, that, that place was pretty cool. That dude was pretty nice because yeah. we, we we may end up having a conversation about something that's not even music related. Yeah. Right. You, you know Just what I mean? So it's, so it's more yeah. about selling that experience of coming into the store, right? Like The hospitality. To, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It goes back to the restaurants, right? And mm-hmm. stuff is like, because if I was just going to be the straight snobby record guy, I'd be like, no, I don't sell that record. Get out of here. Go go to Walmart. Go to Walmart. And, go to Walmart King. and get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, well, why would I do that? Like, even yeah. though real talk, I just said that's. That's the way that I'm thinking, right? Like yeah, I'm, yeah. I am thinking like that, but I have also said, hey, you know what? You don't have to push, you don't have to put that out on everybody, right? You can just be like, man, you know what? I don't have that record, but I'm not going to give you attitude or make you feel like you're lesser than me because that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to help you out. So instead, I'm going to say, hey, you know what? There's this other record store yeah. that might have that record. Mm-hmm. And that also allows me to, to, to share, right? And help another small business. And help this person that wants something that I don't have not feel like I'm judging them as well. Yeah. Right. right. Because yeah, because it's hard for me not to have that. I'm sorry. Like, that's just, it, it is. But I become more aware of how I present that and how I make, how, how, and this is something that's been, and this is, this is it. This is, it all comes down to this statement. How your actions and what you say and what you do make other people feel. Mm. Mm-hmm. Period. Regardless of how you feel about it. And that's a perfect example right now, right, of that whole situation that we just described. Like, I know how I feel about it, but it's just like, but how is what I'm saying going to make that person feel? Regardless of how I may feel about the thing, you know? So, yeah, yeah. So absolutely. it's super important. So I've, so I've had to learn that. Except for some like, of these PC snowflakes. I mean, you can't control what everybody gets upset about. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. For sure. <laughs> I'm with you, though. The, the, a normal, rational person just acting out of love and right Yeah, so, so like, let me just be cool, right? And, like, yeah. and like, let me just sell you an experience, right? Because the cool thing about, the, 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 the great thing about the story is that we also sell vintage clothing out of it. Oh, it's high. So there's a bunch of like, it's it's really fun because I now have like two different demographics coming into my store. Like I had to um, rent out some of my store to a clothing store, and these this clothing store they're called the Warehouse. Um, they're awesome. These kids are great, and, and like and the thing is too is that they're 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 younger than me, right? Like I'm I'm gonna be 44 this year, and so these guys, you know, I'm getting up there, and I'm getting real old, you know, I'm getting real old, but um. These guys are like, you know, in their early 20s, early 30s, mm-hmm. you know, and it's and it's really funny to like see and be around them. Right. Because what's very clear to me is the the difference in the generations. Right. Like and honestly, like I'm really impressed with this younger with these younger generation of kids. Like mm-hmm. and I think that the funniest thing is that one of them, his name's Jonathan, um, He's become he's become a cool friend, but there's been incidences and there's been things that have happened where he relates something that I can relate to. Okay, I'll give you the example because I'm being very vague here. He describes his relationship with his dad as like he said, like you know, my dad was kind of like you know, kind of difficult to get to deal with, and it's kind of like you know, was always angry and was kind of mad. And he goes, so I grew up like you touched on saying. Kind of being like scared a little bit, yeah. like being scared of him. And he didn't necessarily say that, right? But the point that he was trying to make is that like there was a time when I was in the store, something was happening, and I was getting really frustrated. And I'm the type of person, traditionally for most of my life, this is changing. But for most of my life, I've been the person that wore the emotions on the sleeve. So when I was upset, you knew I was upset. 
right? And I also notice and recognize that I also, that it's such a strong thing that I can change and shift the whole feeling of a room, right? Yeah. And so there was a time when I was in the store, something happened and I started to get frustrated and it started to come out. And every and I can and I'm looking around the room and I can see everybody's faces and they're like on oh, eggshells a little bit. Like, you know, like and I'm thinking to myself, like, wow, look at what my actions are making everybody feel. Right. And so a few days later, Jonathan comes up to me and he's like, Hey man, he's like, he's like, You can't do that, dude. He's like, You can't do that. He says, like, we're in a store, like there's customers, there's other people. He says, you, you, you can't do that. And this is, this is a 27 year old kid that's telling me this, hmm. you know, and I, and part of me wants to sit there and be like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> 27, what the fuck are you talking about, kid? But I, and then right afterwards, he says to me, he goes, he goes, I spent a lot of time watching my dad be very angry about things. And I, and then all of a sudden it all hit. And I was like, fuck, I was like, damn, I was like, you know what? I grew up with a dad very similar. Except my generation accepted it and and became that thing. His generation said, "I don't want to be like that." Hmm. And he was telling me in that moment, like, "Don't be, don't, don't be, don't be like my dad, dude." And it like really hit, you know. That's and I was crazy. just like, it's "Heavy." I was like, "Oh shit!" Like you're, yeah, you're right, dude. Like, mm. You know. But it was me also having to say, "Hey, chill out and listen." Maybe maybe this kid has something to say that you can learn from. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because really what it all comes down to is like he's talking from an experience that he had. It has nothing to do with his age. Right? He's right. talking about an experience that he had. Right. And so there's me with that whole mentality and ideas like, oh, what do you know? You're a kid. Oh, man. It was an experience, man. Dude, yeah. he's right. He's right. And he's right. And he's right. Exactly. Yeah. And it was him recognizing something that he saw already and telling me. Hey, caring enough, right, to say, hey, don't be like my dad. Because really, his dad was very much like my dad. So really what he was telling me was telling me, don't be like your dad. Dude. And that's going to hit harder mm -hmm. than. And that's exactly yeah. what happened. Especially because I'm going through, I've been going through something with my dad over the last couple of years. My dad got real sick, and so I had to start taking care of him, right? Mm. And up to that point, I had a horrible relationship with him. Oh, it's a rough Horrible dynamic. relationship with him. And all of a sudden, I'm put in a room, and I'm saying, they're telling me, like, okay, you now have to take care of him. True. And there was no healing. There was none of that Ooh. came before that. It was straight, I hate my dad. My dad's a piece of shit. Fuck him, fuck him, fuck him. To, okay, now you got to take care of him. That's a movie. Movie. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so all of this was happening all in the last. This is all happened in the last. This happened in 2022. And then I got into a relationship. And then I started to understand and recognize the things and issues that were coming from my childhood mm -hmm. that were working. You know, like it was like crazy. Perspective. Crazy. <laughs> you get a new relationship with something that's going to trigger your childhood stuff. So then you're it's, watching your childhood stuff impact the relationship, which yes, would have been a little more behind yes, the smoke dude, and mirrors of what is it was, behavior. Super it was, woven it and complicated. So right. Crazy. That's crazy. It was so crazy. It sounds like life in general has had a proclivity to reveal itself to you. Like it keeps coming for you, man. Like in, in, in the last, <laughs> I'm going to say, man, in the last, in the last couple of years, dude, it's been. I mean, a guy walked up to you and said, really what's your ever. dream? Here's your dream. That's it's not a super common experience. Experience, I don't think, but like, don't have everybody. You've got this life that just keeps coming right at you, man. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, that, that's what it sounds like. Right? Awesome, yeah. it's really cool. <laughs> I sit here and hear that. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. What it, it sounds like. And but the thing that I realized the most about my dad, and this was probably the, the the most beneficial thing that helped me, and it helped me in not just my relationship at the time, but in all of my relationships, because I also started to understand and realize too, like. A relationship is a relationship, like whether it's romantic, it's a friendship, it's it, it's it's a child, mom, neighbor, like it's still a relationship. And there's a very common thing that needs you need to address and needs to be upheld, right, for that relationship to be worth it, to, for it to be healthy, for it, whatever it is, a friendship, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I realized with my dad was, was that I I thought that I was over it. What I really did was I just took all this anger and frustration and hate and I compartmentalized it and I just put it away. Mm. Right. And I just put it away. And I said, I'm just going to put it there. And it's not going to enter my life because mm. it's, it's there. Off to the side. Right. But like caps get leaky. 
seals break. True. Right. And so those things started to seep out. These things that I felt that I had compartmentalized started to seep itself into my life. And it was finding itself into my life in ways that I didn't realize. Road rage. Mm -hmm. Frustration. And I started to recognize and say, you know, like, yeah, why are you frustrated? Why are you upset about this? What is making you so upset? And I started to recognize and realize the thing that was making me upset was all the anger and frustration that I was carrying from my father Mm -hmm. that I hadn't dealt with because I decided to just put it away. Right. And so once, once he got sick and I had to start taking care of him, it forced me to like solve that sort and, through it and take care of that. And I thought that once I got him, so I started taking care of him. I started helping him out. He started getting worse. He eventually got better and he got into a place where he's good. So he got put into a nursing a facility, care facility and he's good. Nice. And so I thought, cool. I'm done. We're good. Like, we're good. That's resolved. Like, I'm finished with that. Yeah. And then little things started to happen. And I said to myself, oh, wait a minute. This isn't done yet. Right. And so one of the things that was huge was, was that I was, my dad would always say, I love you. I love you. I love you. But I never felt it. I never felt it. Because the actions, right, they, they just weren't there. Right. And so here I am, a grown man. And. For the first time, I'm doing stuff for my dad, and I can feel that he loves me. Mm. And it's the first time it's ever happened. And I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, oh, shit, that's what this feeling is. Right? But it took me so long to, like, get over. What I had to do with my dad is I had to just let it go. Mm. I just had to say, you know what, dude, you're not going to get an explanation for that specific incident and that conversation or that thing that he did. Because guess what? You're not getting an apology. Not because guess his what? Capacity. Because mm-hmm. guess what? He doesn't remember. It sticks out to it, you. It, yeah. it, but he don't remember that right. that happened. Yeah. Right? He don't remember that comment that he made or that thing that he did. Because that we can all think about those things and not remember that time that we did something, right? Like Because we've all done it, right? We're human, yeah, right? years ago. Right. So I had to let go of that. Like, you're not going to get. Of uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. And I had a friend who um, I played baseball with and his dad and my dad were really good friends and they all hung out together and did everything together. And his dad was very similar with him. And he told me, he says, you know what, man? He says, when my dad was dying and my dad was passing away, he says, the only thing that I ever wanted was an apology. Right. He says, I want an apology from my dad. He says, and when my dad was dying, I got the apology. But he wasn't apologizing to me for me. He was apologizing for himself. Because hmm. he's sitting there dying and he's dying and he's thinking about all these things that he said. And right. this is when now he wants to, to be apologetic. And so he said to me, he said to me, he said this to me. He says, he says, so what I can tell you is, is you can you can hope that you're going to get that apology from your dad your whole life and not try to work for that apology and understand him and understand it. Because when you do get it, it's going to feel so fucking backwards because you're going to realize that he didn't really do it for you. Mm. He was apologizing for himself. He goes, and that's, he goes, and what it ended up happening is that made me even more upset at him. Mm. And I was like, wow. And what I understood was that the mistake that he made was that he didn't really try to get in there and understand it completely. Right. And be a little bit more like, hey, you know what? I'm going to let it go. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so when I finally let it go and I said, I'm not I'm not going to be upset anymore, it all started opening up. And so now I'm at the nursing home where I'm at the care facility and I go see my dad and he needs this just this just happened last week. He uh, he had a seizure and so he fell and his health is still like not the greatest. Right. And so he had a, a little incident and he had a seizure and he fell and he broke his glasses. Mm-hmm. Right. And his glasses were all broken. And so I get to the I get to I get to visit him and he's just like, hey, you know, me hold my glasses, you know, and they're, they're all broken. So I'm like, and I'm feeling a little frustrated because I'm just like, damn, well, I only got 30 minutes, 45 minutes to spend with you, but you need glasses. And then he wants to go. But I'm just like, yeah, but like putting you in the wood, putting you in the car. The thing. It's just like it's just a lot, you know. And so I'm finding myself like getting frustrated. And then I had to stop and say, hey, he can't see right now. How frustrating is that? Mm. Like, how frustrating is that? Right? And so I said, all right. So I went and got him his glasses. And when I came back and I gave him his glasses, he was so fucking happy. 
Mm-hmm. He started crying. Mm-hmm. Like, thank you. And I was like, oh, shit. There's that love. What a big switch. A big swing. Yeah. What a big swing. Yeah. And I was just mm-hmm. like, wow, there's that thing that I wanted my whole life. Right. And here I am getting it. Yeah. He's the one that's more worse off for not having had it for you well, until you, you, this and, phase in his life. And, and 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 I think the crazy thing is, is that just what you just said, I can catch and I can see him realizing it. Yeah. Like as it's happening, like in real time. Yeah. And to me, I'm just sitting there and I'm just like, wow. Mm-hmm. And what all trip. that's, what all it's done is it's healed. Mm. That's it's all good. just healing. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's been, it's been crazy. This there's year, something this, to be said for those losses awesome. this, this for your pain. Crazy. There's something to be said for that. That it sucks. Like you're you're probably not doing that downwards, so that's good. No, no, no right. No, no, you can no, kind of no. stimmy that, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. because I recognize it, right? But I also start to think about like John, the kid at work, telling me, "Don't be like your dad." Right. In these incidences and moments where I'm catching it and saying, "It took him his whole life." Like he's now like practically dying. Yeah. And he's barely getting it but he's not even understanding that he's getting it fully fully yeah you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. it's a trip to think about it you know it's never too late it's never too late exactly earlier is better yeah yesterday is better but today is just as good so and so now what i find for the first time in my life is i want to go see him wow you know what What a switch yeah Yeah. whereas before it was just like i fuck that dude like oh i hate you Mm. angry 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 yeah now it's just like, cool, I'm going to go see you tomorrow. Yeah. And when I walk in, he lights up, lights up and I feel the love that I wanted. That's awesome, man. Yeah, it's really cool. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's really cool. It's really cool. But I had to let go of all this stuff, right? Like there was so much that I had to do to get to this point. True. Right? So. Dude. Yeah. I love that, that stems man. with understanding yeah. yourself. And that's the, And that's, the more you start right. to understand yourself. As soon as I gained some level of that, then I started to see everybody else differently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I got this Sicilian stepfather whose father couldn't return the I love you on his deathbed. Okay. So I got some empathy. Can right you imagine that? Said, right. So mm-hmm. the generational stuff, because man, my kids are subject to, I, I, I almost feel like it's welling up channeled, you know, it's not even me. It's my stepfather barking. Yeah. It's like, it's, you know, so, I, so I try to own it fast in real time. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, it's good. all it, there's there's, you know, it's very personal. It's very, oh, yeah. very different for everybody. Oh, yeah. But these commonalities. It's are, a very common right. story. Yeah. Everybody, you know, in, yeah, in the human I experience. About, yeah. You know what I talk about? The like, human condition. People yeah. have a very similar story. All just people. It's all, it's all just in a different way, but it's it's all. Dealing with relationships yeah. and ourselves. Like, l- luckily for me, like, I have a wonderful mom. My mom's fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. Somebody else's story is maybe with their mom. You yeah. know what I mean? So like, it's, yeah, it's don't all... even know what that's like, right? Yeah, like, that's yeah, gotta then, be its yeah, own kind of for, trauma. Yeah. And then for yeah. me to think about that, I think about that. I'm just like, man, like I hear stories, right? Like, or I hear people, friends of mine, and they'll say things about their mom or like their dad or like their brothers or like their relationships with them. And I'm just sitting there, and I'm just like, what? Like that's yeah, like, right. That, that's how you are with. That's how you interact. You know, that's how y'all are. You know, and so it, what it does is it when it, and it, and it, it's all tying back to, I think, the thing that we've been talking about this whole time, being appreciative and thankful. Right. You know what I mean? Letting go of things. Yeah. Like, if your dad could have yeah. let go of whatever, what, like, you had to let go of your feelings about your dad to open the bridge to connecting with For your him dad. To rec- yeah. But if he could have let go of whatever was stopping him from bridging to you when you were younger. That may have saved, that may have saved his his relationship with my mom it right may saved, you know it may have saved all these relationships but yeah the, the the grateful thing the thing that i'm thankful is that i'm able to recognize it see it and learn from his mistakes yeah right because that's I think, awesome because i think as a parent that's what you want most is your children to learn from because you could be a drunk just repeating right? exactly what happened to you and not give a fuck and yeah. but there's something about that that your spirit like you had a will to fight that to be different to you felt bad when you realized that maybe you were even potentially acting in the same manner in the same way yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah, i don't yeah think other people delude themselves a little bit or they keep the box like more secure a little bit just mm-hmm. so that way they don't have to quite feel all of those like it's too mm-hmm. painful to even recognize it like they right. just have to keep it buried you know right and but, unfortunately that's where that's where the biggest learning that's where the biggest growth happens is is in that pain face yeah. the music is like really owning something and like sitting with it and like feeling it like that's where you learn mm-hmm. yeah. that's where the lessons come from and that's where the the desire to not be that person more really comes from. 
Hell yeah. Well, shit, yeah, man. I think we're actually running out of space on the, on the cameras, so we're going to have to wind it down. This is going to be the audio portion of the pod. But thank y'all for joining. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. y'all coming out. A lot to we... say. There was a lot to say. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're good. I probably talked a whole lot. We can yeah. literally go for days. We yeah. can go for days. I'm telling yeah. you. What a great, great discussion, boys. Yes, yeah, boys. Yeah. Absolutely. Not the last. Love you guys. Plug Appreciate the it. plug the shop one more time. Yeah, Friends of Sound, 700 Fredericksburg. Friends of Sound. Instagram. New spot coming soon. Yeah, Instagram Inst- socials. Friends In- of Sound. Instagram. Friends of Sound. SA is the Instagram. Uh, yes. Follow us. Let's go. Look for Sylvester's tasting room in neon somewhere. Sylvester's coming soon. More everything, more pods, more lives. Yeah, thank you for coming out, man. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It's awesome. Hell yeah, let's go. I gotta piss. (laughs) (laughs) Deuces. Rolling through the city to the light show. Really ain't no telling where we might.